You guys, welcome to the fifth session of Dismantling Doubts. Um, you guys, as we always do, I want to start out by asking a few review questions. And uh, if you want to answer for your team, just drop the hashtag answer and inshallah I can kind of call upon you and hopefully we can kind of distribute the points. Um, as you'll notice, some of the questions are quite complex, so you don't have to answer the whole question yourself. Just take a crack at it. We'll give you half the point and the other team member the other half point. So the first question is a little bit loaded. And um, we're going to ask uh, we're going to ask team Abu Bakr, of course, to start things off. So you guys, here's a question. What are the two, three ways in which naturalism shoots itself in the foot? That's basically another way of asking, how does naturalism refute itself? Now, I gave three or four different things, so you don't have to give me that just one answer. There are different, there are different angles that you can take to answer this question. How does naturalism shoot itself in the foot? So, let's begin. Timo Bucker, what do you got? Five. And four. And three. All right, Rafa, get us started. Let's see what you got. I have three, four things here. Uh, hopefully, you'll capture one or two of them. Go ahead. Um. So the first one is like their statement that they say the science is the only way to the truth. And we talked about um how there's physical claims and metaphysical claims. And physical claims are things that you can prove through physical verification. So their whole basis of saying that science is the only way to the truth refutes it's not a physical claim it's a metaphysical claim so they can't talk about things like the unseen when they're like they'll they'll say like science is the only way to the truth but they can't prove that like about the unseen so their opinions about the unseen is is invalid from the get-go mm -hmm. so rafa you so all the way till the end it was perfect well articulated you were systematically building in at the end you brought another claim and you kind of fuse the two together so oh, okay. I, would have, I would have stopped right there where you said so they're making a metaphysical claim about physicality and that's just self-refuting that's good then the second problem is that that they very confidently speak about the unseen that's the second problem. Well, how can you be confidently speaking about the unseen when science is limited to the seen? The only way you can say that since I see the seen, if I can put it that way, there can be no unseen. The only way to make that statement for you is if you can physically verify it. But you can never physically verify the unseen. So the only way to say there is no unseen is on faith. But you're not okay with faith. So those are two different. So very good. So you got two out of the four. Fabulous. Thank you, Rafi. Um, anybody else in uh, Team Obaker wants to add something? Because there's one more. And there's one more way uh, naturalism really undermines itself. One really, really important uh, discussion that we had last time. Five, four, three, two. Sister Fatma. Uh, actually, Amar, Amar stepped in real quick. Amar, go ahead. From, your, from Team Obaker, you get the dibs. Go ahead. Uh, for a lot of like scientific laws and things, they uh, say that God is like a mechanism and they're using that to like go against uh, theists. But in religion, God is more of an agent and that just like well, well, But Amar, that argument is th that would be a good answer, which is to the next question, which is how does naturalism pitch a science against God? But we're asking, how does it refute itself? So do you have something for that? Um, is it that they're basically saying their own minds aren't uh, reliable because they can't really like see that? Okay, you're almost there. Sister Fatma, what do you have? Yeah, I was going to add that since they say their own minds are not reliable. So and why do they say they... that? Why are they forced to conclude the minds are not reliable? Because they're adapted to like just for survival. Very good. And so because of that they can we can say that oh naturalism also a result if you say that the mind is unreliable and only for adapting then naturalism can also be just a product of like the unreliable mind so it's not reliable <laughs> yes yes so, so let me word it a little bit more um uh, let me word it in a way that's slightly easier to follow you guys <sighs> naturalism is married to evolution you need to remember that this is the only game in town for them 
And according to them, your brain is the end product of mindless processes of nature. And we saw the clip where we comedically heard John Lennox say, well, if it's the end product of mindless, unguided processes, then do we really trust it? Should we really trust it? That's the first thing. The second double whammy is because they are married to evolution. Evolution tells us that your brain is all about survival, not necessarily the truth. That opens the following possibility. And I've, I was thinking a lot about this. How do, how do I articulate this point? Because I think last time this point was a little confusing. So let me try another way to deliver this point in the least confusing way possible that I know. Naturalism is married to evolution. And evolution says your brain is all about survival. That's the first priority, not necessarily the truth. That opens the possibility that there could be a false belief. But if it helps you survive, your brain's like, ahlan, ahlan, no problem. Well, if that's true, then how do you know naturalism is not a survival convenience, you know, but rather an actual true belief. Because naturalism could be false and your brain's all good about it, all okay with it, because it helps you survive. So you just undermine the credibility of your mind that your mind is not a truth-seeking, truth-seeking entity. It's more of a survival-seeking entity. Well, if naturalism, the product of the same mind, man, then the naturalism itself shot itself in the foot. So that's really how Naturalism runs into a lot of problems. All right, with this in mind, we move on to the second question. Wow, that took a bit, a bit of time here. Team Omar, then, help us with the second question, which is, how does naturalism pitch science against God in a really unreasonable manner? You're creating this false dichotomy, a false conflict. How so? How so? Articulate that out for me, Team Omar. Five, four, three. Amir, let's begin with you, bro. Bismillah. Wait, Amir, hold on. You're not in Team Omar. So we're going to have to start with, uh, let's start with you on us. Um, can you re repeat the question, Brother Mir? Well, um, <clears throat> well, let's start with Mason, and then we'll come back to Yunus. So, Mason, let's see what you got. Sure. One of the ways in which they pitch science against God is they say that religion can't advance in a society that's focused on God. But a response to that is... Well, why, why do they say that? Well, why do they say that? Because of the uh, policies of the Christian church at the time. Mm -hmm. That's true, but th there's one more reason why they said, well, remember they were making the claim science only progressed when we kind of took God when out of we stop, Yeah, when we stop believing in God. And we start believing oh. in like, what, sorry? I was, no, I was just going to jump in and help you out. They, they kind of oh, make for that. go for it. Alley -oop, bro. <laughs> Alley -oop. They, they kind of make that claim where they say, like uh, Brother Mir, you also mentioned in class, you said, uh, we discovered lightning so now that we discovered lightning you know we don't need a god of lightning anymore oh we very good god we don't need the god of sea anymore so basically um once we discover something we don't need god anymore thank you uh for being here well once we discover the natural cause of something so imagine like back in the days in some superstitious society they saw a rainbow and they're like oh the handiwork of god and his angels they're like well once we stopped going towards supernatural and focus on the natural science progress. It seems on, on a surface level, that seems like a very coherent statement to make. So we're saying now that you're unreasonably, you know, pitching, pitting God against science. So go ahead and answer. Why is that an unfair conflict? Yeah, I feel like it's an unfair conflict because it's, um, it just doesn't, it doesn't allow them to, um, see the supernatural portion of it i guess you could say that you're almost there you're all, there's more there's more four uh, mason you got anything from uh, team yes. or three go yeah so I, I would say for that again bringing it back to a law as the agent rather than the mechanism a law doesn't have to be like the lightning and the rainbow he's just the one who set all the systems in place for the science to take place for the very phenomenon. good God is not the material cause. He's the agent cause. So give us an example, uh, Mason, before we can close the loop on this. Yeah, exactly. So just like Brother Annis was mentioning with lightning, it's not God necessarily that is the lightning or you have to worship him because he causes lightning. But he set all of the systems in place, all the physics in place for lightning to even happen in the first mm -hmm. place. So mm -hmm. he's the agent. He's the creator, not the lightning. Very cool. Anything else? There's a better example to give. We, like we, you, you gave the ex you gave the example in class where um you were uh 
boiling water for coffee? Yes. So that example where you, you could say like, hey, why are you boiling water? Oh, you're boiling water for coffee. But then you also ask the other question and then you can get deeper into it because molecules. I, I, I would, I would phrase it a little bit differently. Anna. So here we go. Water is boiling. You're trying to discover the cause. Uh, yes. If you don't go with the naturalist mindset, you would say water is boiling because chemistry and uh, temperature and electrons are, you know, buzzing around. Yes. That's the material explanation. Yes. But does that get rid of the agent, which is me, who's boiling the coffee? It does not. Therefore, these two explanations from an agent angle or from the material angle, angle, they're not conflicting with each other. They go hand in hand. They're complementary, not contradictory. Very important. Another example I gave you, just because you understand how an engine works, a car's engine works, and you understand the laws of internal combustion that make the engine and the pistons move, does that get rid of Henry Ford, who invented the engine? Not at all. Do you understand? So the explanation from an agent's point of view or from a material cause point of view, they're not in conflict. You can continue doing your science. You can continue focus on all the material natural causes. Great. That doesn't get rid of the agent because someone still had to set the entire system of material causes in motion. That's what God is. Understood, folks? Okay. You guys, articulating is very, very important. Clear articulation. Otherwise, a, a, a sophisticated atheist can easily pigeonhole you. And that's why we do these review sessions. If I correct you, by the way, say, I would say it this way. Please don't take it personally. I'm really helping you out in articulating it the right way so you can come across in a very confident, robust manner. And that's why TA review sessions are important because that's your small group, comfortable setting to get that practice in. All right, very good. That leads me to the third question. Here we are. Team Rathman, how does fine tuning prove the existence of an almighty designer? We looked at various aspects of fine tuning. Take me from these observed facts to an almighty creator or almighty designer. Um, Anas will give you half a point for uh, for the effort, just so the team Rathman has one full point. Um, okay, here we go. So team or team Rathman, this one's for you. Amir, go ahead now. Bismillah. Let's see what you got. Assalamualaikum, everyone. So. Um... Basically, the the causality uh, shows that, like the fine tune shows the, the the evidence of God because if anything were to be like slightly out of order, let's say the existence of life wouldn't have been possible. Mm. So, um, like you know, the difference of zero point zero 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 one, like you know, could have like not just cause like a whole new reality but like you know the the non-existence of life itself so everything like you know happening in a perfect order in a fine-tuned manner points towards a mastermind creator mm. not just like random acts of events you know excellent well put so I think well put armor thank you anything else anybody else wants to add from team earth five four three two and and when I think Amir captured most of it, maybe one thing I'll add, Amir, to what you were saying is that when you look at nature, there's not just one variable. There are multiple variables that all had to be simultaneously fine-tuned for life or matter or chemistry to even take place. How can you just chalk that up to chance? Because the, the complexity of nature is either by chance or by design. Chance just seems so utterly absurd and incomprehensible as the hypothesis. So it really seems like someone has designed it. And this is something that human beings naturally, intuitively understand. When something is this complex, this uh, arranged and configured in such a specific manner, it, you, it screams the fact that someone had to set it up that way. So there you go. I would add those two things. Team Khadija, here we go. Next question. Second last question of the day. How do we respond to John? When he says, well, our universe being so fine-tuned is just the luck of the draw from the infinite universes out there. Let me say that one more time. John says, the atheist, our universe being so fine-tuned, why are you so impressed? After all, there are infinite universes out there, and just by sheer probability, one universe is. So what, what they're saying is that there are multiple infinite number of universes out there with their own ratios and their own laws and their own constants, and one of them, obviously, by sheer probability, would end up with our configuration where life is possible. What's the big deal? Why are you so much in awe that you need to infer a designer? Team Khadija, how would we respond? Five. And four, and three, and two, <clears throat> and one. 
All right, sister, sister Nuzhat, which team are you in? You are in Team Khadija. Sister Nuzhat, you get the priority. Bismillah. Okay, so I can go through the multiverse theory. So if they say if there's a lot of different universes out there with each with their own probabilities and dynamics, the main thing with that is it's a theory. There's no evidence supporting that. You can't be sure. There's no scientific evidence. So that doesn't really I count. would use the word observational evidence because they do have evidence okay. in a mathematical sense where they can do some fancy calculation. But, mm -hmm. but how do you observe with a telescope or a microscope other universes? So that, there's no observational evidence. Keep going. So then that's one thing. And then with the multiverse theory, you would you can ask them what leads to a multi what leads to a multiverse, and you can say something created it. Well, what created that? Something else created that, and obviously that could lead to infinite regression. So at the end, you would beautiful. have to go back to the creator. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Anything else, Team Khadija? I will give her sister knows that if no one else wants to chip in, um, then we would basically give you the whole point. One thing that could be added, as sister knows that kind of building upon what you said, is that these different bubble universes or parallel universes that you're positing with your own laws and constants and dynamics. Who is setting these, who's setting these different settings or who's varying these different settings? Like what is this universe generating mechanism? If this universe generating mechanism itself is something material, it would have to be very fine tuned. So like you said, is this kicking the can down the road? Now you gotta explain where is this, what is this universe generating mechanism? And also it violates the Occam Razor's law where you, a simple explanation is often the best explanation. You're unnecessarily being so metaphysically extravagant, positing a gazillion universes so you don't have to recognize the complexity, complexity and the design of this one. It's your God surrogate, as some of the uh, philosophers, these philosophers have to say. Okay, with this in mind, we are going to go to the last one. Team Aisha, this is, one is for you. Why is it intellectually, uh, here, let, hear me out properly on this one. Why is it intellectually rash? Why is it intellectually impulsive to ju judge something in nature as poorly designed? Or time. Why is it intellectually absurd to judge something in nature as poorly designed? Okay, here we go. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, Sister uh, sister Aina and Sister Zainab, hopefully you guys can uh, tag team and uh, give us some aspects of the answer. So, go ahead, Sister Zainab, we'll start with you. See your hashtag first. Yeah. Um, so, like, it starts with the idea of who are you to state that something is poorly designed? Like what qualifications do you have to be able to analyze something and decide that it's poorly designed if you aren't the one with the, like you don't know the intent of the designer and you don't have the qualifications of the designer. Like how can you easily, how can you say that something um, is poorly designed? And then on top of that, Give us a quick example where not knowing the intent of the design makes you a poor judge. Um, Examples are very important, so you don't sound too abstract. Yes. Aina, help me. <laughs> um, so an example I would say is like, um, let's say you're playing video games and the graphics are really bad. Um, so like the, like you would say like, oh, the graphics are really bad. This is a poorly designed video game. But actually like the intention was to save data because you're playing on like a mobile device. Um, so like, okay. that's like an example of you misjudge something because you didn't understand the intent of it. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, the example I gave last time, Sister Zainab, is that if you notice some of the fanciest cars in the world are literally one inch off the ground. And if you were to drive them around, you would literally you know damage everything and you would conclude it's poorly designed what you don't realize is a race car and needs a low center of gravity and needs to be close to the ground so as an as an amateur who doesn't know the intent or has the qualification of an of a sophisticated engineer you can make hasty conclusions by the way didn't humanity for a long time we reached a hasty conclusion that heavier the object the faster it falls until Galileo came around and said no that's not true in a vacuum they would all fall at the same speed it's counterintuitive because as a rookie, as an amateur, you can reach a judgment that when you achieve greater level of expertise, you would be seeing something differently or seeing something differently. It happens all the time. So 
that's why if you don't have the qualifications, and the reason you don't have qualifications is because human beings, we look at a cell and we're blown away by the engineering. We're not at the level of whatever engineered a cell. We know that, or whatever engineered the galaxies. So you recognize your finitude, you recognize your place, and you're looking at these incredible phenomena, and you still have the audacity to say, but allow me to be the armchair critic. Please, sit the heck down. So. Uh, if there's anything else that needs to be, I think uh, I think that really covers it well. Uh, Sister Aina or Sister Zainab, anything else needs to be added to this? Um, I mean, the only other thing I would, because we talked about this, I think, a little bit in like the TA session was like the idea of if you're so quick to judge and say that things are poorly designed, um, it kind of like goes against the idea of naturalism in the first place and that we should be like looking into science to give us explanations to things. And so if your first instinct is, I don't understand this, so clearly it's poorly designed and that's done, then you're going against the idea of research and digging in deeper to find the intent and find uh, the behind things. Beautiful, well said. And what was that famous example I gave you? This example you guys need to memorize. Junk DNA. Mm. Junk that, DNA. Like we for years thought that we only used such a small portion of DNA and then we did, got more access to, to technology and research that showed us that that's not true at all excellent excellent wow what an amazing review session you guys thank you so much oh dark matter for that matter yes very cool very cool okay alhamdulillah wa shukrillah may Allah bless you guys thank you very much uh, i'm gonna quickly stop sharing my screen now it is time to start our class bismillah um let me pull up where we're gonna start from today all right you guys Uh, let me see if you guys can sh see my screen. I'm not entirely sure yet. I don't think you can. Now we should be able to. Here we go. All right. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahi r-Rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi wa wala. You guys, welcome to the fifth session of Core Academy. We are almost at the midpoint of our course. And... If you guys just humor me for a second, I wanted to give a little pep talk since we are at the midpoint. I think it's really, really important that occasionally we just zoom out and just reflect on what we're doing and where are we right now. You guys, do you realize that Allah chose you and the 23 individuals in this class to be exposed to His religion in, a such, a, in such a cutting edge, in such a rationally um, sophisticated manner? Like, I don't know if you realize this, and again, I'm not trying to toot our horn here, but just perspective is important. You are being exposed to your religion in a way that the rest of the ummah can only hope for. Just the other day, I got a phone call from Bangladesh. Uh, someone on, on my IG just called me up, and he had these types of questions that we are covering in class right now. And he's like, I have no access to this knowledge. Who you do? And that's God looking out for you. Actually, on that note, it's a bit of an unfair question, but if someone's looking for a half a point, God looking out for you, that connects to a hadith I shared at the very beginning of the class, of this entire course, actually, when we were talking about virtues of knowledge. Anybody remembers? If you if you are, if you know, it's an unfair question, it's a small retention of detail. So, but if you do, we might as well honor it. Uh, what was that? Um, Anas, do you know it? Five. Is it four. the hadith? Is it the hadith where... Um... If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, he blesses you with Islamic knowledge. Okay, you're very, very close. We'll give you half a point. Anyone has a better wording for it? I guess you can just flip through your notes at this point. Um, yes, it's part of the verses of seeking knowledge. Let me see. Sister Aina, you have the, the wording for us? Ah, there it is. Yeah, whoever Allah wants special goodness for, he grants them deep understanding of their religion. Yes. You guys, you know my, what my vision and mission behind this class is? I'm hoping to develop an army of first responders to intellectual crises. Mm. That in your own spheres of influence, whether it's at college, MSAs, in your own families, if someone's having philosophical issues, Iman issues, you are the lighthouse in the darkness. So I hope you appreciate the secret opportunity that you have before you. And here's another reason why I'm giving this pep talk, folks. Is that human nature? It is human nature. That midpoint is the dip point, isn't it? Midpoint is the dip point. Just look at Ramadan, right? At the beginning of Ramadan, the massages are full, so packed, we got to put people in the hallways, if not the roof. Midpoint, what starts to happen, folks? Plenty of space in the back. 
plenty of space. Why? Because by midpoint, motivation starts to run low and it needs a little kick. By midpoint, folks, we start to forget why we're here in the first place. Why am I here? Why did I sign up for this course? So revisiting your why, uh, yeah, re revisiting your why reignites your motivation. Connecting with your why is really, really important. I always tell this to my students. Change is exciting at first, messy in the middle, gorgeous at the end. I don't know if this happens to you. I love starting new books. Oh my God, the first chapter is the most exciting. You know, oh my God, new book just came out, first chapter, and then what happens? When you get towards the middle, the grind kicks in, and you're ready to hop like a coddled millennial to just another thing. Yeah. So, so my, uh, the, the talk basically that I'm giving to you is that now we're at the midpoint, you guys, we need to grind through like the committed few. Um, and I really feel if there's a group that can, inshallah, it's you guys. Uh, you guys, mashallah, I don't know how remarkable, if you realize just how remarkable this class has been or the last four sessions, we've been able to maintain nearly 90% attendance, mashallah. I wish we could do takbir, but everybody's on mute. So uh, we'll just mime it. Um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to continue to bless you with steadfastness and longevity. Ameen, ya Rabbul Alameen. Before I start with the class, just quick two pro tips for y'all. Two pro tips. One of them I've already shared with you at the beginning of the course. I'm just going to repeat myself on this one. You guys, the first pro tip. Very, very important. Remind because a reminder benefits. First pro tip. Discussion, discussion, discussion. You need to find someone. If you haven't already, to whom you're articulating these concepts, Teach it to someone in your family, a sibling. Talk it out with a friend. Or just join the tier review sessions. It'll just make your life so much easier. You guys, <clears throat> in the last review session, for instance, we had real clips from the atheists. This is what they're saying out on YouTube, and we were training our students to respond to these real-life situations. I always use the analogy when it comes to knowledge. I use the analogy of muscle training. If you don't use your muscles, if you're not training your muscles, someone tell me what happens. But uh, tell us what happens. Your muscles start to shrink. Yeah. Yeah. At yeah. Very good. I love that. There's that fancy word. Atrophy. Yeah. It's, or another example I give is like holding sand. If you're just complacently holding sand, it's leaking out. You need to maintain it and put it back so it grows or maintains. And subhanAllah, something really beautiful happened this week. Speaking of articulating and discussing and so on and so forth. So one of our students, mashallah, who is in this class, really inspired me this week. I wanted to share him with you, uh, share this with you. I was at Aisha this week at ISM. And alhamdulillah, I see this person at the masjid after Aisha, time to time. And we were talking and bonding, mashallah, you know. And we're just chilling and discussing. And all of a sudden, he dropped this on me. He's like, you know, Brother Amir, you said something in class that really made sense to me. But when I'm trying to articulate it, it's not coming out. Uh, it's not coming out smoothly. So can you just help me out with that? And subhanAllah, we sat in the car and we were just articulating back and forth until that light bulb moment happened, uh, that clicking happened. And of course, I'm referring to our friend Amir uh, from Team Uthman, mashallah. Thank you, Amir, for being having that courage, uh, going, out of your, going out of your way to not just be a passive sponge of knowledge, but an articulator of knowledge. So, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all that tawfir. And that leads me to the second pro tip. You guys, this class is going to get, inshallah, inshallah, easier and easier. Especially as, as we finish the first pillar. But, there will be difficult concepts here and there. And I've noticed students have two attitudes when it comes to a difficult concept. One group of students, they become intimidated. They become a little insecure because they don't often think very highly of themselves. So they're likely to back down. And the other group, they're challenged, but they want to conquer. Two different attitudes. If you're from the first group where you're intimidated and you start getting intellectual cold feet, understand that often you are insecure because people in your life haven't been very kind to you, very complimentary to you, so that you're likely to back down. So at that point, you kind of need to be your own cheerleader or find a group of friends who will cheerlead for you. And you can tell the difference between the mindset of a conqueror versus someone who's just intimidated and backing down. You can tell by the words that they use. Oftentimes, students who are intimidated and kind of ready to throw in the towel. They'll say things like, oh my God, this is too difficult. It's not for me. 
While the other group, you know what they say, right? My brother Mir, it's not clicking yet, but I'm getting there. Look at the difference in attitude. And attitude is what matters. Attitude is the difference that makes the difference. And I'm, I tell this to students all the time. Words have creative power. What you verbalize is what you actualize. So please, we have to make sure that mindset is very, very important when it comes to these when it comes to these things. So conquer it, fight through it, bug me, bug the TAs, whatever you gotta do. You wrestle down the concept, don't let it wrestle you down. And trust me on this, I'll, I'll, and I'm, I'll end my pep talk on this because we gotta get the class started. Trust me on this. Uh, you know, trust me, you, you need to have Iman and Iman in when I say this to you. This knowledge that you're learning, especially what you're gonna learn today, it's making you smart in ways you can't begin to imagine. Yeah. So you see, going back to the muscle, training analogy, when you first put resistance on your muscles and you go to the gym and you first work out, you know, it like shocks the system and you're sore for days and there are micro tears and tears at times. And what happens when you finally heal, you come out so much stronger. Now, you may not be able to see that initially. The process is slow, but over time, man, it mushrooms and snowballs. Similarly, by the time this class is done, you'll have grown in abstract thinking, intellectual depth and stamina and resilience, that now you'll sit through your professor's class and you'll be able to see through things and dissect arguments and analyze things and connect things that others are simply clueless about. So before, okay, so with this in mind, uh, just wanted to ask one question and then inshallah we're ready to begin. Anyone wants, who hasn't already done so, anyone wants to share their intention that they wrote down way back in the days? If you wanted to share, we wanted to give you a half a point. Uh, five, four. Anyone wants to share their intention that they wrote down initially? You know, once again, connecting to your why. Very, very important to keep your motivation stable. Yes, anyone wants to share their intention? Going once, going twice. Amir, go ahead. Let's share your intention. I don't think you have done yet. Done it yet. So uh, I said that um, I want to I want to have a, a logical uh, understanding of uh, of mind. So it, it, I'm not just like solid. I mean, we're losing you. For, let's say if I'm arguing with someone, can you know? Uh, it was breaking up. Uh, can you a hear bit. me now? You could try again. <clears throat> can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So I said like I I I want to have a, a logical understanding of my of my deen, like of what I believe, uh, in such a way that I'm not just like you know uh, not for, just for like the sake of others, like you know that if I'm arguing with a non-believer, like you know I I come out as a winner in an argument, but my ac action based on my belief that I don't really have to have. Like you know that conversation in the first place, and my actions, like you know, they 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 willingly or unwillingly, like you know, like intentionally or unintentionally, give that dawa, you know, that okay, like you know, this makes mm. sense, like you know, the 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 are, yeah, such so. Barakalafi, thank you for sharing. So long. Yeah. <laughs> I got you, I got you, Barakalafi. Thank you very much, you guys. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> We are ready to begin. You guys, we're going to start in your guidebook from page 27. I know we're skipping 26 for now. We're going to come back to it. But for now, we're starting from page 27. If you are um, if you're following your guidebook, I wanted to end the design argument by this famous statement of Fred Hoyle. Uh, what a beautiful statement. You guys, this guy is not the most religious person in the world. But you appreciate the honesty of a naturalist here. Listen to what he says. By the way, we need a guidebook coordinator. Any volunteers going once? Going twice, going thrice. Any gu guidebook volunteers for today? <clears throat> uh, Sister Zainab, have you gone yet? I don't think so, right? Sister? Uh, but you're in the MVP race. That's my only issue. Uh, and so is Amir. He's in, the, he's in the MVP race. Anybody else who's not in the MVP race? Uh, okay, let me, uh, while you guys are throwing your names out there, let me at least start reading this particular quote. Um, Amir, you're, you're, well, we need someone with their mic working and the voice quality uh, stabilized. So that's another criteria. Sorry, buddy. Um, okay, so let me at least read this phrase and then inshallah we'll come back to this. 
to who wants to do this. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as chemistry and biology. The chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way is comparable to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials within. What a brilliant analogy. I just absolutely love it. And that's why I wanted to share it with you guys. Listen to now what he says. Life as we know it, amongst other things, depends on at least 2,000 different enzymes. How could the blind forces of the primal sea manage to put together the correct chemical elements to build enzymes? Yeah. This is, see, you know, you appreciate why you appreciate this quote. This is a naturalist who's not blinded by his naturalism. You're not, he, he's not going to come up with some absurd, ridiculous explanation just to maintain allegiance to his worldview. So, this is, a, inshallah, a good way to kind of wrap up our design argument. And now, you guys, we go back, inshallah, inshallah. To the page 26 if you guys can do me a favor now uh just uh, we're gonna start inshallah the next principle in our toolkit before we move on to the fourth argument i thought it would be the perfect time to introduce principle number two to you which is page 26. um by the way i can't tell you how passionate i am about these principles they're near and dear to my heart and they help solve so many riddles so many intellectual problems i like to think of these principles in your intellectual arsenal as literally weapons that you can unleash in different settings. And in different settings, one weapon might work better than the other, like an ax maybe work maybe better than a hammer or a hammer better than a knife. Similarly, these principles are more powerful given the situation you're dealing with. Do me a favor though, um, just don't look at your guidebook yet for this principle. I want you to focus on the PowerPoint because this principle is a little abstract, and through this analogy that I'm about to give you, it's going to become really concrete and easy to follow. So, let us begin. What is the name of this principle? The name of this principle is... All right, Amir, let's try with you, inshallah. And uh, let's if the sound starts becoming kind of jittery, then inshallah, we may have to look for another person. All right, so what is the name of this principle? Amir, go ahead and prompt us. Bismillah. Um, missing the forest of the trees. Missing the forest for the trees. Oh, this sorry, principle, trees, yeah. yeah, this principle is like a fallacy. Don't miss forest for the trees. Let me give you one line summary and let me get right into the analogy that I want to give you. In one line summary, basically I can tell you is that it is intellectually absurd to ignore the bigger picture because you got confused by one detail. One more time. It is intellectually absurd to ignore the bigger picture, the forest, because you got bogged down in one detail that's rubbing you the wrong way, one tree that rub that's rubbing you, one isolated tree that's rubbing you the wrong way, and now the whole forest is basically dismissed. Let me start out with this analogy that inshallah should make your life easy. You guys imagine, Amir Saab, chalo, bismillah. Can you read it? Um, yeah, in a nutshell, it is intellectually... Absurd. So you're looking at the screen now, so you'll have to toggle... Uh oh yeah sorry I, uh, you, you see I, i'll read the analogy on the screen so it'll make your life easy here we go imagine you are a typical desi who loves japanese cars you and your ancestors have been driving toyota before you were in diapers as mashallah as those of you in the desi families you know you guys based on multiple toyota cars that you've had feedback from your family testimonials and reviews online, you have become convinced of how insanely reliable Toyota is. However, this year, the new Toyota you lease, within the first 2,000 miles, the transmission breaks down. If you guys can pull up the chat boxes for me real quick and answer the following. Would it be rational for you to conclude Toyota is an unreliable brand? Five, four, very good. Someone tell me why. Articulate. Drop hashtag articulate. Let's go. Let's get some articulation training going here. Why would it be unreasonable here to conclude? Right. Very good. Val, articulate it out for us. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, to assume one, or to assume something about a whole group, just with experience from one, is very rash. And <clears throat> I don't know how to help. Yeah, that's good. You're, you're literally, you're on the right track here. 
you're almost there. You're you're generalizing too fast. It's what you call sweeping generalization. Mm. Excellent, excellent, very well. So, in other words, you have a forest of evidence that you're dismissing because of one or two isolated incidents that you could easily explain away, but you're, I guess, not going through the trouble of it. In other words, you can't throw away the entire paradigm because one or two things aren't adding up. Go ahead now, Amir, read the principle for us. From in It is intellectually absurd. I'm putting it up on the screen, or you can use your guidebook, whatever is easy for you. Go ahead, buddy. It is intellectually absurd to dismiss a paradigm that has overwhelmingly evident, overwhelming evidence because of few things that go against it unless... Very good, very good. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean, y'all, that you can never abandon the old views. You can never abandon the old paradigm. If you want to abandon the old paradigm, of course you can. You just have to do a little homework first. What is that homework? Here we go. You, got, you have to kind of demonstrate that the initial evidence and logic employed was faulty. In other words, using my uh, forest analogy here, you kind of have to revisit the forest and figure out why is this entire forest of evidence not applicable anymore. You kind of have to burn down the forest. Yeah. Sorry, my tree huggers. Uh, I'm just going to have to use this analogy here just to get the point across. And second thing, our counter evidence is equally overwhelming, forcing us to think of a new paradigm. Meaning there's another forest of evidence out there that is overpowering the initial one. Now, someone, uh, drop a hashtag for me. If you want to drop a hashtag, answer, articulate, whatever. In the Toyota analogy, in order for this person to actually move on to the new paradigm, the Toyota is an unreliable brand. What would he have to do in light of these two check marks that I just shared with you? How would he go about in being justified in holding the new paradigm now that Toyota is unreliable? What homework would they have to do which would make it rationally justifiable now that you know what yes go ahead and hold a view now the toyota is unreliable what would they have to do sister zainab help us out bismillah and then mason um like if there was a report run that toyota published that said um all of the cars of the specific you know that we made a mis you know we messed up and we ignored safety protocol and now all these cars are all broken then you can kind of come to the conclusion that like okay maybe we shouldn't be trusting a company that decided to ignore protocol mm. and policy very cool very cool or there's a study done okay i'm gonna comment on this in a second uh let me see if there's uh, if there's recall and other experience on the same issue Muhammad mustafa very cool very cool um uh, Anas, where, I didn't. Oh, I didn't see the hashtag, so that's why I. Uh, the hashtag is like by mental cue. Um, Anas, go ahead. We'll, uh, we'll we'll honor your hashtag, even though it wasn't there. Go ahead. Um, I was literally gonna say <coughs> the the recall argument, but I guess um, just to kind of change it up a little bit. Even um, recall, Anas. Recall is a one-time incident. How can that change the history and reputation so, of Toyota? I guess I guess the best way to say it is let's say that whole family had Corollas. Yeah, but this guy buys a Camry, and then he figures out that all Camrys in Toyota are are horrible cars or are are weak in transmission. So, but that, that 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 ruins the Camry brand, not the Toyota brand. You see? I see. I see. You the problem? Very good. So you guys, here we go. Here's what I would do. In, 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 here's what I would say in this situation. This person would have to show how the forest of evidence that he had been using in the past was either fake or unreliable. You have to burn down the forest and then you can move on. So in the case of Toyota, you would have to demonstrate that the the people who were telling you Toyotas are so reliable, including your own experience, was a small minority of evidence. And there's a gazillion people out there online, somewhere, through some reports, who have had a bad experience with Toyota. And that new forest of evidence overwhelms the current one. Understood, folks? Now, you may be asking, why go through this trouble? You know, why can't I just jump ships and move on to a new paradigm and a new belief? Like, that's like you're, you're asking me to do. You're asking me to do too much homework. The reason you kind of have to do go through these, you guys, if you don't go through this tr trouble, understand then that your intellect stands to lose all credibility. Why? There's a little bit of a deep question and for the sake of time. I'm just going to give you this one. The reason is because if your intellect was wrong about Toyota, despite a forest of evidence, how do you know you're right this time around? 
If you don't go through the trouble of doing the homework of why you went wrong initially about Toyota despite so much evidence, and now you're just going to flip-flop into a new worldview, which is that Toyota is unreliable, then how will you ever have intellectual consistency because this new position can easily be contradicted by one little isolated evidence, one little isolated incident. So you are like an intellectual pushover at this point, constantly shifting from one position to another at the smallest little rub. Hmm. So you have to do is revisit the forest, burn it down, and then kind of move on to the greener pastures, as they say. Um, let me see here. Amir, go ahead. What do you have? Well, actually, Amir, hold, hold that up because I got to complete this point further before we introduce some a tangential point. So I, I got to systematically build you guys. Here, let me give you another example or two to solidify this point. I like to call this the black box example. This is a little bit of a silly example, but it really con uh, conveys a point across. You guys know we are all convinced as society that fire has the ability to burn. By the way, we're on page 26. Yes. This was right before the Fred Hoyle comment on your guidebook, right above it. This is a silly example that will get the point across, and you'll see I have a black box example in your guidebook. So we're all convinced that fire has the ability to burn and destroy. We have forest of evidence, fire departments and fire alarms that help us convince that. We know people, for instance, who have had a first degree burn or a second degree burn. A lot of evidence there. One day you're watching the news, though. And you hear an airline turn into a fireball in the air as it crashed. Everyone was killed, unfortunately. As the rescue party searched the debris, what they found is a black box. Now, if you know what a black bo box is, it's an indestructible box that captures the audio recording between the pilot and the supporting pilot. And, and the rescue party says, that the black box was not touched at all. The fire was not able to burn and destroy that black box. And you turn around and tell yourself, fire doesn't burn and destroy after all. That would be ridiculous because you just saw what the fire did to the airline. There's the forest of evidence that proves that fire burns. So, it would be more rational to say there has to be an explanation for this isolated incident. I am not going to throw away the entire paradigm. Now, here's a more realistic example for you guys. A more realistic example is Newton's law of gravity. Did you guys know Newton's laws and equations, they fail in accounting for the motion of Mercury as a planet. So, what do we do now? Throw the entire equation. We can because there's a forest of evidence, once again, that these equations work so well down to the seven degree decimal. To abandon it, you would have to show how the entire equation was flawed. Burn down the forest. Rather, what do we do? We explain it away. That the reason Mercury's motion is not being able to, is not being accounted by his equations, is not because the equation is necessarily wrong. It's because there are other equations and other phenomena at play that supersede Newton's equation. That's where Einstein comes in. Understand, you don't miss the forest for the trees. Same thing, by the way, for theory of relativity by Einstein. It works amazingly well, down to like 14 degree decimal, but guess what? It fails at the subatomic level. What do we do? Just discard it? No, there's so much evidence for it. We find a way to explain it. All right, you guys, now that I've gone through the theory, now I need y'all's help. Drop some, drop some hashtags for me. Tell me now, what are the implications of this? How does principle help you when it comes to your being? That's what I've been building up to. How does this help you in your religion? Amir Hassan, help us out, man. And then inshallah others. Would you use this towards, honestly, it was the fire thing that gave away for me at least. Would you use this towards explaining miracles? So for example, uh, you would give the idea that even though fire does burn everything, there is the chance that uh, a miracle can happen and it won't obey its natural law or what it was intended to do? Um, it could, it could. Um, but focus more so on religion. There are aspects of religion that might throw you off. All right, let me give you one, you guys. Um, the age of Aisha. Hmm. Imagine someone who problematizes the entire religion of Islam because they can't get around the age of Aisha. We have forest of evidence about the character of the Prophet ﷺ. His love, his humility, his kindness, his tenderness. Lion's share of those ahadith come from who? Aisha herself. Are we going to dismiss all of that? For one thing you find on savory, 
which you could easily explain away because it was a survival necessity at that time to marry early. Culture norms of the time. We know, by the way, now that Aisha al was already engaged before the Prophet even got to send the proposal. And we can easily explain it away by the fact that it was a global norm. Age difference at that time, it was not something they cared about because they cared about the family name and the person's character because that ensured the greatest odds of survival. By the way, shameless Sinefix plug, next Sinefix, I am dealing with the age of Aisha in detail. So if you're interested, tune in, inshallah. If you're going to problematize the Prophet wasallam, you're going to burn the forest down of overwhelming evidence we have about who he was. Understand? Anybody else, Sister Fatima, talk to us. Um, I've heard like the woman receiving less share in the inheritance is also very oh. worrisome for a lot of people. Very so difficult. I think it's one of them. Very nice, Sister Fatima, an excellent example. It comes in the Quran. The Quran gives double the share for a male when it comes to compared to the female. And of course, the way we have always explained it is that financial responsibility has always been placed upon the man, so he has been given extra assistance. With power comes great responsibility, and with great responsibility comes privileges. So we can, again, rationally explain that Wait for you to problematize and throw the entire religion under the bus for one thing that you find unsavory. I'm asking you, whatever your tree is that gives you a problem, it could be slavery in Islam, it could be multiple marriages. Yes, Amir, what's up? Okay, just to say my last one. Uh, one of the things that I, I truly find offensive is when people always say, how could God be so unjust and create someone crippled or someone in a, in a, in a poverty like uh, someone is so impoverished by by poorness or whatever that they have no chance in life or whatever and that he was dealt the worst of cards and whatnot and then you have ayat in the quran and he gives you he gives you the sun he gives you the 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 rain he gives you everything everything and then you go and say oh but this person was born a cripple or this person was born defective in some way Excellent. very good it helps you solve the problem of evil because god has a massive track record where he's taking care of you, if one thing goes against the grain, you're gonna throw God over all under the bus? Very nice, Amir, well connected. Thank you, half a point for you. Uh, let me see, let me hear from people who have not yet heard from. So I'm trying to diversify. I'm seeing some of the similar hashtags, which is why, by the way, I am low-key ignoring you. Okay, well, let me let me put, put up the next thing. You guys, someone tell me, hashtag articulate, in light of this principle, do you see why objection from poor design is problematic? Hmm. Someone else. In light of this principle, do you see why objection from poor design is problematic? Amir kinda kinda gave it away already, mashallah being ahead of the curve. But why is it? Why is objection from poor design? So let me tell you what poor design was, right? This is was this is where John the Atheist was like, you know what? There are aspects of nature that seem to be poorly designed. There are flaws in nature. Yeah? Why is that missing forest for the trees? Uh, Val, articulate it for us, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to give it a shot. I think if we, we don't even know a lot of things about our world and how it works. And we're still, you know, through, a, you know, study and research just learning about like the simplest processes throughout our day and to say that like anything that to you seems like not like poor design as you stated it's just it goes back to the idea of we don't know how well, the story cool. or even yeah, well so let me let me help you here. You're you're on a slightly different track of reasoning. You're reasoning from the fact that human beings have a finite point of view. So therefore, you're gonna be you're gonna have to be humble in your conclusions, which is a nice line of thinking. But use forest for the trees line of thinking. You have to build a forest here, and then show why tr bogging down in a tree would be unreasonable. What's the forest here when it comes to the design from, when it comes to the this particular problem? The forest here is what is the forest of evidence here, Sister Aina, that you should be starting out from? Um, so like you can just look at the entire design of like all the systems in the universe and like how those um they work so like your life and stuff like that um but then like what an atheist might try to do is they focus on like that tree which is like dark matter or like junk dna Damn. Um, 
Bam. Very good. Did you guys hear that? So you see, Val, you have to build a forest first. Here's a forest. We have forests of evidence about complexity in nature, from the cell to the intricacies of the human organs, to the fine tuning of the Big Bang and the, and the atmosphere and the ozone layer. And the constants in nature, there's like 20, of, 20 different constants that have to be very precise. You're going to ignore all that complexity and the brilliant track record of nature and get brought down in the human eye design that you're judging, judging at your understanding at that point in time, which may change 10 years from now. And you're going to say it's poorly designed? Kind of like Jim Holt in the TA review sessions. Oh, there are too many coupling constants. Dude, your understanding will radically change 10 years from now when other constants are, are discovered. More we understand about dark energy. Nature has a solid track record here. Forest of accomplishment. We're not going to dismiss that because of one aspect that rubs you the wrong way now, which you will change your mind about later. So... And you guys, one last thing, inshallah, when we're done with this particular principle, naturalism. Do you guys now hopefully understand? Do you understand why we spend so much time dismantling not naturalism holistically? I didn't give you one isolated evidence. I showed you why the whole logic was faulty from the get-go. Self-refuting from the get-go. That it undermines the credibility of the human mind that naturalism itself relies upon. And how so much evidence from the origin studies of the Big Bang and the first cell and the proteins contradicted. In other words, someone say the phrase? We burned on the forest. And guess what? In the rest of the course, we're going to keep fueling the fire. A wildfire. So, with this in mind, I hope, inshallah, this principle is clear. Folks, any questions on this principle before I, inshallah, inshallah, move on? Universe and keeps us alive, the atheist. Very nice. Thank you for uh, sharing that for people who wanted to uh, get that. Thank you so much. Yes, Sister Zainab, go ahead. Um, we, we also talked about this a little bit last week at the TA session. I guess I'm just having a really hard time um, understanding the like the base of why people have this mentality in the first place. And not when it comes like when it comes to religion, but when it comes to everything of the idea of if I'm not the one experiencing it, if I can't um, justify it or, you know, see mm. it, then it doesn't matter. And that can come, you know, through like, racism and and misogyny and you know wow fight against god and the pay difference and you know all the things happening overseas like this whole thing of why like i don't know why i think that's why i'm like yes. having such a hard time I'll... because i can't put myself in that mindset yeah <laughs> So you know, Allah complains about this in the Quran. We're going to see this in the third principle. They rush to deny what they can't make sense of. In other words, human beings have this tendency, since it doesn't make sense to, sense to me, since it doesn't make sense to... Oh my God. If since it doesn't make sense to me, it must be nonsensical. Uh, 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 uh. The reason is, Sister Zainab, there's a really good book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, where he talks about biases, cognitive biases that human beings have. One of them is what they call the representation bias, where our view of reality is often represented by our past experiences. And we become, almost out of survival necessity or whatever, we become very averse to the unseen and to the uncertainty. It's it's some... Uh, it's some I don't want to say lazy, perhaps, but it's this rush, impulsive tendency inside of a human being. As Allah says, Holy Qal Insanu Min A human being is very hasty. So we tend to become very hasty in our conclusions. And uh, and that's something you have to cognitively grow out of. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to kind of grant us that. Um, by the way, one thing to, to help you understand and help you put yourself in other shoes, you'll notice often people will judge something to be bizarre if it runs contrary to their experience. So, and this just tends to happen, what we consider b bizarre and not bizarre is often a function of how familiar we are with it. Um, <clears throat> so, with this in mind, inshallah, we're moving on to the third argument. And you guys, this is where, like I said, we're going to keep fueling the fire and keep burning down the forest of naturalism. So, <clears throat> you guys, uh, by the way, if you didn't get a chance to kind of catch up on your notes, please go ahead and do. I hope you guys have been writing it down. Um, once again, if there are some... Uh, holes here, I will inshallah send this slide in, inshallah. You guys, with this in mind, 
let's brace ourselves for one of the most unique arguments for theism. And that's what we call the moral argument. Amr, go ahead and read the uh, read this for us real quick on the top. God is the best explanation for our objective moral experience. This is what you call the moral argument. The irony is, folks, most people have never heard of the moral argument. They haven't even thought in this direction. As we're going to learn, morality, morality is like grammar. We use it, but we don't realize it. But here's the kick, the irony. On college campuses, though, when you break this argument down, this is probably the most effective argument because it really resonates with the college crowd. Really does. Especially because the woke culture is going, spreading like wildfire. This argument provokes them like nothing else. And I hope it provokes you and resonates with you. So let us begin, inshallah, you guys, in this particular argument. We're going to keep it very organized, very neat in clean boxes, we're going to defend two major statements, two major contentions here. Number one, again, we're keeping it super organized. I hate mental clutter. I want to make sure that you're easily following this. Everything we're going to say is going to fall under one of these two statements. The entire argument comes down to these particular statements. The first is, go ahead, uh, Amr, Bismillah. Islamic theism, Islamic theism provides a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. Very good, keep going. Naturalism does not provide as sound a foundation for objective moral values and duties. Ah, in other words, in other words, we have two goals in this argument, y'all. We're going to show how belief in God sits beautifully with our moral experience. And how naturalism sits very awkwardly, very uncomfortably with our moral experience. And that really leaves theism as the only rational choice. So we're gonna begin with the first one right here, the first contention, inshallah. And I'm gonna park it at the top here so it's always there for your reference. You guys, we're gonna begin with this first contention. And we have to begin with some key terms. Now you may not be familiar with what do I mean by objective and moral and values and duties. Don't worry about it. Inshallah, we are going to break them down for you. Uh, if you guys can do me a favor, we're going to do something called feeding frenzy. Just pull up your chat boxes. I'm going to put up a term. To the best of your ability, don't drop hashtags. Just put the definition in there. And the person who has the closest top two, three will inshallah give them a half a point. So you guys, here's the first term to the best of your ability. Tell me your translation of it. What do you understand from it? Here we go. Term number one. And that is Islamic theism provides a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. What do we mean by morality? Someone tell me the definition of morality. Muhammad Mustafa says, what is right? Right and wrong. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Keep going. The code of ethics. I like that. Nice. What is just? Being able to tell the difference between right and wrong and choosing right. Sister Zainab, I like that as well. So let's give half a point, Sister Zainab. Uh, Muhammad Mustafa, your answer was half complete. It's the study of what is ethical and unethical. Let's put that up real quick. It's the study of being ethical and unethical. And part of it, Muhammad Ahmad, yes, is that right and wrong aren't always black and white. Excellent, excellent. All right, I'm going to deepen your understanding of morality just a little bit. Keep your chat boxes up. This is not for points, but tell me this, you guys. Here's a scenario for you. Imagine, imagine you're working at the Amazon Fulfillment Center. Not very fulfilling, I'm sure. Uh, your job is to work on a project to create a machine which packs most amount of boxes in the least amount of time. Tell me. Does this have anything to do with morality? Five, four, three, at least at the surface level. Is that a moral situation, folks? No, it's not because it's a mundane thing. It's like solving an equation. It has no moral implications. But let me convert this into a moral situation for you. You find out that by creating this machine, which packs the most amount of boxes in the least amount of time, the company is planning to use it, this technology, to lay off workers because we wouldn't need them anymore. Is that a moral situation now? Ah, uh, yes it is, because now you're going to have to ask yourself, should I be engaging in a project like that that is going to potentially impact other human beings? Okay, here, let me throw another scenario at you. You're working in the lab, studying the structure of a virus. Moral situation? Yes or no? It's not because you're just soullessly analyzing a virus. Can someone drop hashtag convert? Convert this into a moral scenario for me, please. Five, four. Three, convert this into morality for me. Drop the hashtag convert. Amar, you're the first one. Go. 
Uh, if this virus is, say, to be used in like biological warfare or something Ooh. like that, that you should not be working on that, or that's what you would be thinking. Yes, excellent. I love it. If if imagine you find out that your company is going to weaponize this virus, now all of a sudden that becomes a moral scenario. Yeah. Or if this virus is going to be used to create a vaccine, that is also a moral scenario because it, there's, it's going to be, bring about some good. All right, now last one is a little tricky, you guys. Take a look at this one, but I love this one. Here we go. Take a look at this, these two phrases. Bucks are a good team. Charity is good. Someone tell me, how is the usage of word good different in each scenario? Five, four. Ibrahim, take a crack at it. Bismillah, what do you got for us? are a good team you're talking about a skill-based team it's not like any type of moral uh reference you're just saying yeah they're a skilled team but when you say uh like charity is good then there's obviously morality involved because you're giving away zakat and there's good intentions involved beautiful couldn't have said it better myself love it you guys understand that you can use good in a non-moral way by the way you can say this is the uh, this is a good route from here to the masjid He's really good at what he does. That's not a moral statement. But when you say, uh, for instance, charity is good, respecting your parents is good, that is a moral statement. So now you hopefully have a good idea of what morality is. All right, folks, we're moving on to the next term then. Notice a statement says something about values. Let's understand that because really I would hate for you to be lost in bloated terms. Values and duties, you may not use these terms on a daily basis. They sound kind of vague and vacuous. So let's make sure we understand them concretely, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of obsessed with making sure things appeal to you in a concrete manner. You guys, what do we understand by values? Give me a definition, please. An easy one. Moral guidelines and priorities, set of beliefs that guide you, moral values, importance of certain ideas. But all, you're very close. I'm going to give you half a point. Almost there. You guys, values is very simple. Personal priorities that you choose to follow. In this context, though, when we say moral values, we're referring to, very simple. Ready? Ready for this one? It's the moral label we place on something. And you really have two labels to place, good or bad. Simple. All right, folks. So. What is the moral label of charity? Obviously, good. What is the moral label of stealing? Bad. Now tell me this. What is the moral label of manufacturing cereal? Just off the left field. What would you say? What is the moral label? Neutral. Very good, Amar. Neutral. I like it. Amar and Sister Zainab, half a point for both of you. It's neutral. Now, depending upon the intention behind it or the end in mind, it could become good or bad. But understand, it's neutral. You playing chess is a neutral situation. There's no moral value you can place on it. But if you're if it's causing you to, you know, ignore your parents or miss your prayers, it becomes a moral situation then. All right. Very good. So this, this leads us, inshallah, to the next one. Duties. What do we mean by duties? Moral duties. Okay, I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to give you guys this one because I got a pace. It's the moral obligation to do good or avoid wrong. You guys understand what this means. Sometimes, 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 something may have the value, the moral value of goodness, but that doesn't mean you're obligated to do it. Like, imagine, give me, a, help me out with this quickly. Let me give you a scenario. Tell me uh, what, would, what would be the value of it, good or bad? Helping some, uh, giving someone a loan to help them. What is the, what's the moral label we would place on that, folks? I know it's obvious, but just humor me real quick. Okay. But does that mean you, as a broke college student, you're obliged to help? Hmm? No. So even though it's more, the value is good, but the duty may or may not be there. Understand? You don't have to feel guilty if you're not the one able to help. Now, let's take it up a notch. Ready for this? Racism. Standing up for racism. Do you have a moral duty and a sense of obligation? Oh, yes, you do. You should feel guilty if you never care about racism at all. It should bother you. What about, what about corruption at your company and you feel like being the you know, whistleblower? Yeah. If your company is doing shady things, should you blow the whistle? You should feel some level of moral obligation and duty, hopefully. Here's a, you, you, even a more intense one. You see someone who's physically disabled drowning and you're passing by the beach. Do you have a moral obligation now to help? Should you put your life at risk? Ah. 
So this is what you say, this, this is what we mean by, uh, if you can swim, yeah, otherwise you'll both drown. Yeah, yeah that's why, if you, assuming you're a decent swimmer, of course, of course. All right, now that you guys understood all of this, now we come to the most important term. The most important term. I've been building up to this. Objective. What do we mean by objective? Someone help me out with this one. When we say Islamic theism provides a sound foundation for objective moral values, what do we mean by objective? Have you guys ever heard someone say, yo, this is objectively wrong? Have you ever heard that? What do we, what do we mean by this? Unbiased. Rafi, I like that. We'll give you half a point. Well, what do you mean by universal truth, Sister Aina? Break that down for us. Or just put it into the chat box. What do we mean by something is objectively wrong? Hmm. Would you agree with me? Like no one can deny it based on it's set in stone. Would you guys agree with me when something is right and wrong independent of human opinion? Can we say that? Yes. Well, if you don't agree with that particular definition, we can actually... Um, we can, um, so, so actually, let me uh, clarify this definition real quick. When we say something is objectively wrong, it's almost like saying 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's objectively true. It doesn't matter what anyone says. And when you say something like rape is objectively wrong, what you're saying, it's so wrong that even if all the world, the entire world became rapists, it would still be wrong. It doesn't matter what the opposition says. It's objectively true. Uh, so let me give you guys, let's do a little experiment to see if you guys are believers in objective morality. Here we go, ready? We're gonna do a little survey. Um, let's see if you guys believe in objective morality. Here we go. You guys, tell me, is racism wrong? The answer hopefully, hopefully will be yes. Yes. But, now before you answer the next question, think a little bit. Sure, you're, you're gonna tell me racism is wrong, but is it objectively wrong? Before you answer, here's what that means though. When you say racism is objectively wrong, what you're essentially saying that if the, if all the KKK members think otherwise, if the majority of the world became racist, it would still be wrong. Is that the case? Yes, it's still wrong. What about Holocaust? Is Holocaust objectively wrong? If you say yes, understand what you're saying. If the Nazis, Nazis won the World War II and convince everyone they are right, Holocaust would still be wrong. Yes? Okay. Okay, so what about this one? Is Sati objectively wrong? Now, you may not know what that is in here. I'm not looking for yes or no. I'm looking for your emotional response here, folks. Let me tell you what Sati is. You guys know in Hindu cultures, they burn the bodies. Sati is when the husband dies before the wife. So while they're burning the body of the husband, they also burn the body of the wife who's alive. What's your, what's, your, what's your reaction when you hear that? Hmm? Are you morally outraged? You see that outrage you feel, how real that is, how real it feels to you that that's wrong? I don't care if in the entire world becomes Hindu and believers in Sati, wrong is wrong. Yeah. So, oh, by the way, someone drop a hashtag real quick, quick for me. Um, hashtag answer. Can someone tell me what will be the consequence of denying the objectivity of it? Mm. That's what I mean, because things are understood in their contrast. What would be the consequence of someone saying, yeah, it's wrong, but not objectively wrong? So what are you saying then? You know, what, what would be the, the, what would be the, um, Amir, talk to us. So I think uh, as long as like, you know, it's not pertaining to you, you can always say like, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's wrong, but not always, you know, you know, like, maybe like you know like they deserved it or something like that you can always find like you know reasons to to justify it i guess mm, yeah but look amir hassan man subhanallah there you go you guys if you say it's not objectively wrong what you're saying right and wrong becomes relative then that means right and wrong become relative to how a group feels about it and what what is right and wrong depends upon how human beings stand on something at one point in time where the majority stands where the power stands or people in power stand, or where the culture stand, and then it'll keep changing changing from generation to generation. If you open that door, do you understand how disastrous that is? Because if right and wrong is not objectively true, but it's more so subjectively true, depending upon how the society and majority feels, I'm asking you then, how can you condemn Sati to be wrong when the entire society at that time felt it was right? We know tribes right now living in Papua New Guinea, by the way, they, they're called the last cannibal tribe alive. 
the the Korowahi tribe. You guys, it's so disturbing, and I'm bringing this example intentionally. They were able to finally meet a member of the tribe who had participated in cannibalism. They asked this person, didn't it feel wrong that you were eating, cooking other human beings? He said, yeah, it felt kind of wrong, but what do you want me to do? Everybody was doing it. Everybody was okay with it. So it was okay. We've kind of just, the ducks, ducks just lined up. How could you condemn genocides of the past if morality is relative? The perpetrators of the genocide could easily say, well, we thought it was right. We were in charge. The public opinion was on our side. No, no, no. You need some objective standard that transcends human opinion. And y'all proved to me above just now that there is an objective moral standard. You felt very strongly about it. You, it felt so real to you, just like the real world. So, if you understand this, by the way, but now we're ready for the million dollar question. If there is an objective moral standard that is outside of human opinion, and we all feel there is one, tell me then, what is the basis for it? Mm. Who or what decides what's objectively right and wrong if not human beings? You guys, this question is so critical. I don't know if you've given a lot of thought to this. Imagine you're talking to Nabil the Nazi. Yeah, uh, I uh, invented this person. Imagine you're talking to Nabil the Nazi. And just so, just so you know, a, a Nazi is a naturalist. He doesn't believe in God or hereafter or ultimate right and wrong. It's all about survival of the fittest in this jungle of life. So, you're talking to Nabil the Nazi and you are, mashallah, a passionate defender of humanity. You want humanity to hold hands together and sing Kumbaya. You're like, Nabil, killing people just because they have a genetic dis disorder is objectively wrong. You're pounding the table on this. And you know what Nabil says? Very calmly, very composed. You know how he responds? He responds by saying, says who? Mm, says who? I don't care about your feelings and opinion. Hmm. I don't care about your feelings and opinions. So you are getting frustrated at this point. So you're like, but you're taking a human life. That's just wrong. So he responds to you by saying, so what? Once we kill all these degenerates, we'll clean the human gene pool, saving the Aryan lives of the future. So we're back to the million dollar question, aren't we? It says who? Where does this objective moral standard come from, you guys? Hmm? Where does it come from? We all feel we need an objective moral standard so we can condemn atro atrocities like these, like eugenics, that this person is referring to. We don't, we, we don't want to be in a position where someone can just say that that's your opinion. Says who? So what we're, what we're going to learn now, inshallah, in the next slide, so you guys are going to see, inshallah, for Muslims, we can very comfortably answer this question, y'all, because for us, God is the basis of this objective morality the objective moral duties and commands and values. And you're going to see that a naturalist can't answer this question. Here's the irony for a naturalist. A naturalist today feels as outraged by Holocaust as you do. He's as morally outraged, feels that Holocaust and Sati is as morally objectively wrong as you do. But for you as a Muslim, you can ground your objectivity in God who's outside of human opinion. A naturalist cannot. And you'll see why, and they'll get awkwardly stuck. So, with this in mind, let's inshallah look at Islamic theism real quick and see inshallah how we can very comfortably answer this question. So, Amr, go ahead and read what's on the screen. Bismillah. And you guys can put this in your notes. God's character and commands are the basis of objective moral values and duty is binding on all regardless of human opinion. There you go. Right and wrong are independently real because God is real. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter where I stand or my society stands at one point in time. A huge group of people may think burying their daughters is alive, like the Quraysh did. But we can still condemn them 1,400 years later. Not, not because it's my opinion against theirs and my moral standard against theirs. No, no, no. It's their standard against God's standards. Hmm. Number two. Go ahead, Amr, when you're ready. You may be on mute, buddy. I'll go ahead and read this one then. God is morally fair, so he has endowed us with a moral instinct and a compass, which is why we have such strong moral feelings. 
That's why you were outraged by Sati and Holocaust. The fact that you feel morally outraged at evil and the fact that you are delighted by good. You guys, do you know what this tells you? And this is just a side beautiful point. I don't know how many of us think this deeply. Have you guys ever thought how beautiful it is that you feel delighted at good, outraged by evil? To me, that's evidence. God has to be good. Why? Because God is the one who has given you this moral compass where you can tell apart right from wrong, where you are delighted by good, outraged by evil. Na'udhu billah, astaghfirullah. If God was evil and unfair, why would He give you the ability to tell the difference between good and evil? If He was evil, He would make us all evil to our core <laughs> and we would find, and we would all feel that's completely normal. The fact that you feel delighted by good, allergic to evil, outraged by it tells you that this morality has to stem from someone fair. Hmm. That's where your moral compass com comes from. And then finally, the last one, of course. God has honored God the... Has... Go ahead, Bismillah. Sorry, you're back up. God has honored the human beings, which is why human lives are uh, sa uh, sacred regardless of race, genetic uh, disorders, and intelligence. Yes. Allah has invested humanity with special significance. Which is why human life, I think we all intuitively know, is worthier than the life of a rat, or a sheep, or a camel. <laughs> Look, I think I speak on everyone's behalf. I hope you agree with me. If you were given a chance to save one human life uh, at the expense of 10 monkeys, uh, I think we would all choose human life. Uh, because I think we intrinsically understand uh, that the moral worth of a human life is greater. But see, for a naturalist, this becomes problematic because on naturalism, you are as much a product of mindless evolution as the orangutan, you know? So what's so sacred about you over any other organism? Oh, and by the way, this was the logic Germans used in the early part of the 20th century where they ravaged and massacred islands in Africa because they said when they looked at these Africans, please don't be triggered, I'm just conveying what they said. They said these Africans, although they're homo sapiens, they're closer in the evolutionary ladder to the monkeys than they are to the homo sapiens. Nothing is intrinsically worthy about them anyways. Let the fittest survive. And a war was waged to take the resources and basically depopulate whatever you have to do because they dehumanized them and devalued them in the process. It's such a wicked worldview as you're going to see. Theism, you guys, provides the basis for human rights and human exceptionalism. And also in the process, it makes everything else sacred because at the end of the day, all the creatures and everything around you is a creation of the same God. Now you no longer rape the planet for your bottom line. It's sacred. It's God's property and domain. And by the way, Quran is so beautiful on this. Just for your reference, some of the ayats right here. Man, look at how... I want you to appreciate the intuitive appeal of these ayat, man. So beautiful. Look at this. Allah says, Huwallahu alladhi la ilaha illahu. He is Allah, no deity worthy of worship besides Him. The most loving and caring, the sovereign, the pure, the source of peace, the grantor of security, the guardian over all, the almighty, the compeller, the truly great. And then, this is the ayah, by the way, that is said in every khutbah. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan wa ita idhil qurba wa inha. God commands justice, doing good, and generosity towards relatives. And he forbids what is intrinsically shameful and blameworthy and oppressive. He teaches you so that you may take heed. And then finally, of course, when it comes to human worth, Allah says clearly, we have honored the children of Adam, carried them by land and sea. We have provided good sustenance for them and favored them, especially above many of those who we have created. So I hope you appreciate that on Islamic theism, Values, moral values, moral duties, and human worth are all beautifully, comfortably accounted for. Now, this is where John the Atheist will throw a little bit of a wrench. So he comes at you with the following question. Amir, go ahead. Read what's on the screen here. Uh, well, if God has endowed you with this objective moral compass and instinct, then how come you, you religious people differ on moral issues like abortion and LGBTQ? Yeah, so John the Atheist comes, kind of kind of once again crash the party, or like, oh, so much, mashallah, you're so, okay, he's not going to say mashallah, but you have all this objective morality and moral compass. 
wow, you're so woke. So tell me then, why are all these religious people differing on all these moral issues, huh? What happened to your moral compass now? How do we respond to this, folks? Drop a hashtag answer for me. Um, um, well, I mean, Christians are more lax on LGBTQ than we are, for instance. Uh, there are all sorts of differences of opinion when it comes to abortion. So then how do we respond to this, folks? If there is a moral compass that's objectively right and wrong, uh huh. then how come there are, there are so many differences of opinion on so many different moral issues? But uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, there's only one correct moral compass. But um, even even the interpretations, like the like the Ten Commandments, they're they're fairly similar to uh, our our rulings. But it's just um, some some uh, churches or Christians don't enforce it the way that it, it should be. Oh, so it's uh -huh. not really it's not really the commandments that's the that's the issue or the laws or um, like jurisprudence on the topics. It's more so the individuals enforcing them. Uh huh. So you're saying it's not the compass is messed up; it's the interpretation that's messed up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. There's another answer we can give. Mason, what do you think? I think you can go back to which makes something objective, which is it's not open to human opinion. It's objectively right or wrong, regardless of human opinion. With Christian denominations, their basis for their morality changes based on the denomination. For Islam, our basis never changes; it's based on the Quran and Sunnah. But, but see, objective morality is built inside of you, like we intuitively know, right? So we're not even bringing revelation into it right now. If human beings all have this objective moral compass, shouldn't, be, shouldn't we always agree on moral situations? No? Shouldn't we? If this objective morality exists? So, you guys write this down. This is a mic drop. And I, we have Sister Sana Shakir to thank for this. May Allah reward her for this beautiful wording. Listen to what she says. God has given us a compass, not a map. Bam. Bam. So, our moral instincts, like our compass, orients us in the right direction. But that doesn't mean we will specifically know in every situation what is right and wrong. And that's where revelation comes in. So take abortion, for instance. Our moral instinct orients us that taking a human life is wrong. It's sacred, the human life. It shouldn't be taken. But based on instinct alone, can we figure out when the fetus is a human being? That's where Revelation has to come in and give us a detailed map. Yeah. So go ahead and write this down as an answer to this question. Our moral compass orients us. And this is where it goes what to what Bara was saying. This is where Revelation comes in. And when people tamper with Revelation, misinterpret it, that's where differences kind of emerge and kind of go out of control. And last point I always want to make, I love this point. Here we go, you guys. Secondly, just like a compass can malfunction next to a magnet, for instance, moral compass can malfunction next to desires, selfishness, and biases. Oh, yeah. You guys, a mother knows oftentimes that her son is wrong and her daughter-in-law is right. The son is the oppressor. The daughter-in-law is the victim. But the bias kicks in, doesn't it? The love for family kicks in and it overrides the moral, con moral instinct and that inner voice. So your moral instinct can be subdued, silenced. You can keep snoozing it like an alarm. So that's how we answered that particular question. Yeah, isn't it, Amir? Barakallah feek. So uh, you guys go ahead and kind of commit this into your notes. I'll give a few seconds, inshallah. And that leads me to the second objection of John the Atheist. Okay, if anybody still is copying, please put it into the chat box. Otherwise, I'd like to move on. All right, going once, going twice, going thrice. I think people are by and large okay. So here we go then. So the John the Atheist says now, Amir, go ahead. Okay, so explain this to me. If if you all have a sense of objective morality, how do you explain the horrific history of warfare caused by... Ooh. Oh, so you all have a moral compass, huh? What happened to the, that moral compass in Crusades, huh? Conveniently, your objective morality was turned off and as you were at each other's throats? What, what happened to objective morality? Ah, how do we respond to this, folks? Mm, Rafi, talk to us. Um, well, you can just say it's the human aspect of like greed and all the negative aspects of the humans that drive it. Like the humans are the mechanisms and they use religion as like per se like agents to drive their um 
motives. I like that. Very good. As an excuse, but you can't. You have, you have to look at religion like objectively and its message. You can't look at um, people and how they interpret it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Take a, so here, so Rafa, you caught the first point. Religious people are not angels. They can succumb to their self interest and biases and can choose to ignore their moral instinct and revelation. That's not a jab at the moral instinct or the objective morality of it. It's jab at the frailty of the human being who doesn't comply by it. It's like the person who's diabetic. They know eating sugar is bad. They can ignore it though and still go ahead with it. It's like a smoker's mindset. They read the warning on the, on the cigarettes, but they can choose to ignore it. That's what being human being is all about. You have a choice. Oh, and uh, second thing, by the way, in fact, corrupt people often use and abuse religion for their political ends, giving religion a bad rep. If not religion, they'll use nationalism, racial supremacy, and other ideologies. Amar, you have something else? Yeah, I was just going to say something similar, like people don't have to follow it exactly. And I was going to say, like, if you take like a kitchen knife, like it's made for like cooking, you know, someone could use it to murder someone. It doesn't mean it was like kitchen knives are bad. They're, they're used for cooking. That's what they're made for. Yes. Very good. I love that. That's a great analogy. You guys, yesterday in our finance seminar, we learned that day trading is super problematic. Believe it or not, I was just discussing with someone and we were making plans for day trading. And I wasn't aware of the trade settlement period being two windows. And anyway, right now, now that I know, obviously the plans are being canceled. Do you know, I felt this bias inside, inside of me. I'm like, you know what? Let me shop for other opinions. I'm sure somebody must have made it okay. Come on. A little extra research shall save the day. You can, you can silence the inner voice. You can ignore revelation. Human beings are really good at it. Oh, and finally, uh, one of my favorite responses. Um, oh, hey, John, at least we have a standard. At least we have revelation to go back to, which can correct us. What do you have? Hmm? On your world, you neither have a standard, nor is there a possibility of a standard. So sit down, son. Like, as we're going to learn why this statement is true on naturalism, they can never be an st objective standard on their worldview, as we're going to see in a second. <laughs> so you have no, uh, you have no credibility. You have, you have the nerve and the audacity to say something. Yeah. So these are, again, some responses you want to kind of commit into your, commit to your notes. Inshallah, inshallah. Hey, we have a hashtag deep. I haven't seen that one in a hot minute. Yes. It's just funny because <clears throat> if you think about it, when they comment on our, our objective morality and our compass and our moral compass and all this stuff, then they'll, they'll call it, oh, that's, that's bull and whatnot. And they'll bring up these LGBT issues. And then yet they'll completely negate the fact that the British invasion of nearly the world, and then you have the French following, and then you have the US jumping into every single country that has a little bit of resources they can, they can snatch. And then they use the, the whole imposing, we're putting our free, we're throwing, depositing our freedom in that country and whatnot. And it's just, and then you asked where's, okay, what's this about? And nothing. It's just, uh, oh, we're just spreading our liberty and religious freedoms and ideologies mm -hmm. to other people. And, and they'll be completely okay with that. Naturalists will be completely fine with that. Like we're bringing back this backward society from the caves that they're living in and whatnot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, another thing I would add to that, Mir, when they say like, oh, we're, uh, we're, we're making progress on the LGBTQ. Look how much freedom we have given them. You're assuming on your worldview, there's a standard. Yeah. Which says LGBTQ is humane. 30 years ago, you were different on this. Prostitution is a great example. 30 years ago, taboo, illegal. Today, it's humane. So you don't have a consistent moral standard at all. It's wherever the cultural winds are blowing. So, so where is this notion of progress coming from? When you say progress, you're implying you're moving towards an ideal. You don't have an ideal, as we're going to learn, by the way. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. You're going to see, inshallah, on their worldview in a second now. Why? Okay, so basically, let's just quickly, we're going to stop right here, inshallah, and take a break. You guys, so, alhamdulillah, we have quite comfortably defended that theism has the resources to provide basis for objectivity of our moral values and duties. And we can ground these ob we can ground these objective values of right and wrong in a fair and just God who transcends human subjectivity. And now, inshallah, after the break, we move on to the second one. And let me just give you guys a heads up. It gets dark and wicked really, really fast. Personally, I'll repeat this later. When I study naturalism, 
and what it has to say about morality, wallahi, I shudder. The chills I've gotten, not the ones, not the chills that inspire you, but that, the ones that horrify you. More, I've gotten more of those chills here than anywhere else. So we're going to pause right here, inshallah. And after the break, come prepared to be on the edge of your seat because this is where it gets, gets chilly in a negative sense. Okay, you guys, thank you so much for being an amazing audience. Uh, it's 1240, so inshallah we'll pause. And inshallah we'll resume at 1250, inshallah. And I'm confident that we should be able to... F I'm fairly confident. I shouldn't be overly optimistic that inshallah we should be able to f finish on time. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa sirli amri wa hlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. You guys, we started this argument where we said God is the best explanation for your moral instinct, your moral experience, the fact that you feel so strongly about certain things being right and wrong. The fact that you feel that there are things that are objectively wrong and right, that there's this standard, ideal standard there. And if a particular society feels that that wrong is right, doesn't matter what they have to say. It's objectively right or objectively wrong. We said theism has a capacity to accommodate that. Now we're moving on to the second contention, which is naturalism does not provide as sound a foundation for objective moral values and duties. I'm being very hum humble in my wording here as sound a foundation they barely provide any foundation at all but we're going to be humble about it and uh, inshallah we're going to work our way from there so here we go you guys we're going to make we're going to unpack this claim in three points and you're going to notice in your guidebook those three points are a b and c once again i want to keep things super organized almost like an outline in your head two mega claims we defended the first one now we're defending the second one and there are going to be three key points here a B and C. And once again, hopefully I'm reducing your mental clutter so it's easy, smooth for you to follow along. Now, let us begin with the first. Why is it that on naturalism, there is no sound foundation for morality? Here we go, you guys. First thing. Amir, Bismillah. If you're there. <clears throat> yes. Our our, our na on naturalism, human morality is a result of undirected, unguided forces of evolution. Very good. This is the starting point. You guys, on, on naturalism, obviously there's no God. Everything has to be explained in terms of physics and natural causes. So they have to explain, where does this moral reaction that human beings have come from? You know, like electrons, electrons and protons are not having moral reactions. You know, you're not going to find morality in a test tube. But human beings who are made up of the same matter, why do they have moral reactions? So obviously, they're going to turn to evolution. They're going to say human morality is a result of unguided forces of evolution. And the reason we have moral reaction is because morality is an aid to survival. Yeah. Understand this. This moral instinct you have, where you feel horrified about rape and about torturing little kids. By the way, they did a study, by the way where uh, they were studying two, three-year-olds, just two, three-year-olds, and they were showing them the scenes of kids being pushed off the swings. And this little scene is being watched by, individually by these toddlers, these uh, two, three-year-olds, and almost all of them had the same reaction of being horrified. They felt it was wrong. It's weird. We have this instinct that kicks in. So a naturalist has to figure out where does this come from if it's not God. So... They say it comes from evolution because evolution has wired this moral behavior into us because it helps us survive better. Just like a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative behavior that aids survival, their primate cousin, Homo sapiens, display the same, display similar hashtag moral behavior. This is what they call herd morality. Someone tell me. Do you know what this implies and why this is so... You know what door this opens? Amir says, they are natural, there the naturalists go against using their flawed and unreliable brains to try to explain our deen. Uh, or ex explain a human phenomenon. It, it's not even our deen that says, I mean, you can feel the objective morality, right? So yes. Um, well, do you know what? You know what door that opens? You can do whatever it takes to survive. Mason, very good. Half a point for you. Anything that aids survival is potentially moral. Very good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. But even worse. Something really worse, something very dangerous, the door is open to. Amir, what do you think? So if survival is guaranteed at some point, then morality basically disappears. Because if morality is strictly for survival, then if you eliminate the survival need or aspect of it, then do you need morality at that point? Oh, 
So if your goal is not to survive, let's say you are someone who's like, I don't want humanity to survive because they're killing the planet. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be the reasons every other species is going to die off. So I don't care about human survival. And human morality becomes probable. Well, then do you really have to be moral at all? So that's very good, Amir. Now, I'm going to word it in a way where it's easy for you guys to write down in your notes. You guys, here's what it implies. Had we evolved differently, our moral instinct could have been easily different. Mm. Do you understand what this means? Evolution, on a naturalist worldview, evolution wired us in a way where infanticide, killing children, feels really, really wrong. But the same evolution has wired lions in a way, you guys, where they commit infanticide regularly. It is observed in the animal kingdom. Did you guys know? Did you guys know that why we as human beings, on a, according to a naturalist, we're wired in a way where rape feels really, really wrong. But it has wired a white shark in a way where it doesn't. You know, they forcefully copulate white sharks all the time. There's, that's their mode of behavior. In other words, evolution could have gone either way. So whatever mode of behavior you ended up with, there's nothing objectively right and wrong about it. It's just whatever natural selection hardwired into you. Do you guys understand where this is going? Please, someone drop a hashtag paraphrase if you want to help me uh, give me the feeling that you guys are understanding where I'm going with this. I don't know if you're horrified. Yes. On this worldview, morality is arbitrary. It's whatever genetic gene mutation wired you with. And it happened to wire you in a way where rape feels wrong, stealing feels wrong, murder feels wrong. But hey, if you had ended up like the lions, killing a zebra would have been perfectly fine. Or uh, you know, committing infanticide would have felt really, really okay. Ah, uh, you, you, by the way, you may think, you may think I'm putting words in their mouth. Listen to what the naturalists themselves have to say and watch how crazy this sounds. Yet somehow this is, no one bats an eye. Michael Ruse, a prominent philosopher of biology and a famous atheist, by the way. Go ahead, Amir, read this for us. Morality is a biological adaptation, no less than, uh, sorry, I, these windows are... No less than our hands, I should say our hands, not, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Keep going. Uh, our, no less than our, our hands, uh, our hands and feet and teeth. Ethics is illusionary. Wow. Keep going. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, uh, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such a reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusionary. Uh, folks, someone drop a hashtag danger. What is the danger of this worldview? Once you turn morality into a, into a construct of society or biology, do you, where, where, what, what cascade effect it's going to have? What floodgates are you opening, Anas? You're opening the floodgates of people not caring about other people at all so killing doing whatever wrong is just okay because it's just illusionary oh in other words what you're saying if morality very good honest we're gonna give you half a point for this once you pro prove morality is the construct of society or biology and it's then that it's arbitrary N naturally the possible next step could be then why be tied to it you guys isn't that the worldview you want as a serial killer as a tyrant or as a mass shooter that all the rules about sacredness of human life and not murdering is just evolution brainwashing us or society brainwashing us. And that's what you notice, by the way, right? These mass shooters, what do they do at the end of the act? They commit suicides because for them, there's nothing on the other side. Oh, there is hell to pay on the other side. Yeah. Listen to what Steven Pinker says, a prominent, world-respected uh, naturalist and a cognitive psychologist. Go ahead, Amir, read this for us. If our species has evolved in different ecosystems or if we were missing a few genes, our reactions could go the, the other way. Now, if the distinction between right and wrong is also a product of brain wiring, why should we believe it is any more real? Oh, Lord. And, and now what I'm about to show you is a statement from Charles Darwin himself, the man, the architect of the evolutionary theory. Listen to what he says. Someone please paraphrase Darwin. And show me that you're feeling what I'm feeling. Here we go. Listen to what Darwin himself says. At least he's honest. 
if men were reared under precisely uh, under precisely same conditions as hive bees, there can there can hardly be a doubt that our unmarried females would like the worker bees think it it, it as a, a sacred duty to kill their brothers and mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters and no one would think of uh, interfering this happens in a bee colony this behavior wired by evolution occurs in a bee colony what he's saying someone paraphrase this for me what is he saying folks put this in your own words articulation training someone come on Amr, you're already speaking. We need someone else. Amar Ahmed, help me. He's like the way he's looking at it. There's really no difference between us and any animal. It's just the circumstances that we're under. But from like our point of view, there's something else that differentiates humans from every other living organism. Yes. Yeah. Some. So what? What? What else? What else? What is he saying? The moral code that you feel so strongly about. It's just evolutionary circumstances you were under. Had you been under the same circumstances as the beehives, guess what? Your moral code would be killing members of your own family and no one would bat an eye. No one would interfere. Just like in a bee colony, no one interferes. Honest, talk to us. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Like, um, would we have been in a bee colony, us, our, our mothers killing us or whatever is happening, the other bees would just kind of like shrug their shoulders like, oh, this is just another day. But since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as human beings, we do not have that morality that uh, hive bees have. We have different uh, uh, default settings that Allah gave us. Yes. You know well, yeah. So that's our worldview. But notice on their worldview, just how arbitrary, how chance morality becomes. It's just whatever you got. Is whatever hand you ended up with. You know, in poker, you randomly end up with a set of cards. That person ends up with a set of cards. <laughs> well, this is the set of cards you ended up with. Totally random, unplanned, undesigned. This is your morality. There's nothing objectively right and wrong, whether infanticide is wrong or right. And lions do it. You don't. It's because your gene mutation went this way. There went that way. <sniffs> My God. So, folks, let's put Nancy, the naturalist, on trial now, shall we? So we're about to do something interesting. We haven't done this yet, you guys. We want to see now. I want you guys to play the devil's advocate in a minute. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put Nancy on trial. And we want to see how Nancy justifies this horrific worldview. And this is where y'all come in. Y'all are going to play devil's advocate. You're going to try to think of some face-saving things that Nancy could say on her own behalf. And collectively as a class or myself, we will try to respond to that. So notice what you're trying to do. You're trying to come up with a response, not for us, but on behalf of Nancy. And if you fail Nancy, she loses, which is still a win for us. So either way, <laughs> we're good. But again, you were, it, it's important to understand how, where your opponents are coming from. Um, so I throw the following thing at Nancy, you guys. Tell me, what could Nancy, how could Nancy wheeze a lot of this? It's important to anticipate what they're going to say so that we can rebut what they're saying. Here we go. We're going to throw the following at Nancy. Amir, read this first paragraph for us. If God is not the source of objective morality, on what grounds do you consider infanticide object objectively wrong when it occurs in the in the animal kingdom? Very good. What could Nancy say here, folks? I mean, this is like evolution has wired them that way. It, it, it wired us in a way where we feel infanticide is wrong. Then what could they possibly, what, what could she say to at least seem you know seem somewhat sane go ahead Anas. Bismillah. so nancy could tell us well since infanticide happens in the animal kingdom and that's how evolution evolved them then um uh it's uh it's not objectively wrong just because that could have happened to us too but throughout evolution um it kind of didn't happen to humans. Mm. So, yeah, I, so, so then, then on what, what grounds is objectively wrong then, right? It could have it could have happened to us too. You know, it's just like the the gene mutation went in a different direction. Sister Aina, I like what you said. Sister Aina says infanticide, infanticide perhaps aids this other species survival in some way where it does not aid ours, so it is objectively wrong for humans. She, that's a very good response. You guys, how would we rebut that then? How would we rebut that? 
that's a, that's a pretty good response. Nancy could say, well, that's what evolution gave us, and we should respect what evolution wired into us because clearly it would aid the survival of the human race. So why not treat it as an objectively right standard? Oh. How do we respond to that, folks? Again, we got a corner Nancy here. So Sister Aina was able to put put up a decent defense for them. How would we respond to that? Anyone? Or should I step in here? Five, four, three, true, one. Okay, here's the first response. First thing we say is uh, the fact you're asking me to respect evolution. More of a, the fact that I should respect evolution sounds like a metaphysical claim, but we'll let that slide. We're going to keep moving here. What if, here's the first thing we can say. What if I don't care about the survival of anyone but my own family and tribe? Hmm? Yeah, I don't care about human race survival. What obliges me? What, what, create, what gives me the moral duty? Why should I care about the survival of the entire human race? What if I only care about the white race, the Aryan race? In that case, infanticide should be okay when it comes to other ethnicities, no? By the way, this is what the Christ ch church shooter who killed Muslims in New Zealand, literally in his manifesto, I don't know why I spent three hours reading his 84-page manifesto, um, but he writes in there, he's like, uh, these little babies that you feel so like compassionate towards, that's a jihadist in a stroller, he said. Yeah, these immigrants and their babies are going to one day become working members of society. Let's nip it at the bud so we can maintain our supremacy. I don't want them to survive. Survival of the fittest. I care about our survival. So sure, I'll stay off of my kids and the kids of my race. I don't care about the immigrants. That's the first problem we, we would. That's the first thing we could say. And secondly, what I was saying earlier. What if you? What if I don't want the human race to survive either? Either I think they're a threat to the planet. Then on what on what grounds is infanticide wrong? Why should I care about any rules? Who imposes those rules? It's just products of gene mutations. Oh, here's the last thing you can say, by the way. The same naturalists, they tell us now, oh, gender is a construct. Ah, Gender, which is as biological as it gets, that's a construct, and we don't have to really abide by that, right? You can choose your own gender. But when it comes to morality, you want me to respect it now. Hmm? So, like, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. So these are some ways that we would go back to Nancy. Um, any other? Amir, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, um, it's more like a question. Can't we argue that uh, it's uh, not even on the moral grounds, but if uh, if somebody holds that opinion, um, like, how, like, who are they to decide, like, you know, like, who, who, like you know, whom to kill, like, or like to take someone's life. I mean, they, it's not in their hands. Say that one more time, Amir. What point are you making? I'm trying, I'm trying to ask like a question basically that who are these people to make the decision? Like who gets to live and who, who gets to die based on like, you know, even if like humans are a threat to the planet or like, you know, someone is bound to be a jihadi or something. Uh, no, like fundamentally, nobody has that right to, to just, take that decision or like make the execution of killing you know so wait, wait, but that's, but that's just... your statement that no one has the right where does that come from but on, on naturalism if there's no god then anyone can decide right for them for themselves any any everybody is at liberty to decide their own moral code does that make sense amir so where i want you to see things from their point of view put yourselves in nancy's shoes on her worldview there is no higher power okay. there's no ultimate standard so then where is your moral morality going to come from? Well, it comes from evolution. Well, evolution could have gone either way. You could have ended up with bear morality or pig morality, or you could have ended up with lion, lion morality, and then you would be con committing infanticide and you would feel that's right. Do you understand how arbitrary evolution becomes? That's the problem with evolution as being the source of morality because you don't know which way the chips would have fallen or where the apple would have fallen and how far from the tree. Okay, so that leads us to the second thing we throw at Nancy. Go ahead, Amir, read this. Uh, on what ground do you applaud self-sacrificial uh, self behavior? Wouldn't it make sense to be purely selfish so you can improve your odds of survival and pass uh, on your genes? No, we all intuitively feel selfishness really feels wrong. But we're asking a naturalist, on your worldview, why is selfishness wrong? Why not be purely selfish so you can improve your odds of survival? So if you're walking on the beach and you're a decent swimmer and that physical, physically disabled person is dying, why, in, why endanger your life and try to save them? Save your genes so you get to pass on. Hmm. 
So, I don't know what I, I honestly I'm I, I'm scratching my head a little bit. What would a, I don't know what Nancy could say here if she agrees to naturalism? How do you weasel out of this? Humans like respect because re respect improves survival in the long term. So that's why people do selfless things. Uh, humans like respect because respect improves survival in the long term. So that's why people do selfless things. What if it doesn't improve survival? Like in the case of the physically disabled person, <laughs> then you understand. A human life is dehumanized because someone has genetic disorders. It won't improve the survival because you're passing on bad genes. So it's very difficult to escape. Yeah. So with this in mind, you guys, a little bit of a summary of the first point. Point number A, on naturalism, morality is hardwired into us by evolution because it aids survival. Had our genetic makeup and evolution been different, we could have easily ended up with a different moral code and instincts. And we would feel that's morally right and that's wrong. So it's really all arbitrary. So that's why, that's the first problem with naturalism when it comes to morality. You can never affirm anything is objectively true and wrong. It's just whatever genetic evolutionary circumstances you ended up with. And that leads us to the second one. For folks, this is B. You think if that was bad, it gets worse. Worse still. Go ahead, Armour. Worse still. <clears throat> worse still, there is no possibility of objective moral values and duties. Why? Because on naturalism, there is no free will, hence no real moral responsibility. Uh, it gets worse. Why? Because on naturalism. They deny free will. Now, I want you guys to, I want to help you understand why is it that a naturalist defi d denies free will? That's a, it's a leap that's not easy to make and not necessarily easy to understand. You kind of have to connect the dots here. So let me kind of help you understand why is it that a naturalist is forced to deny free will? Well, let me ask you guys, uh, let me do a little survey here so you guys can kind of appreciate why is naturalist denying free will? Well, here's the first one. First question for you. Do you think Siri, I, I know this is a little bit out of the blue. Tell me, do you think Siri is self-aware, y'all? Yes or no? <clears throat> no? You think Siri is going there? She has a sense of identity. I am Siri, that's Alexa, and uh, we hate each other. Is that is that how Siri works? No, I, I think the answer hopefully is wrong. Okay, so tell me this one then. Do you think Siri is intentional in what she does? Like she freely chooses? Yes or no? No. Okay, so what about this? Do you think Siri has free will, human free will, to choose her responses? Yes or no? Okay, you guys all said no. Tell me why then. How can you be so confidently concluding that she doesn't freely choose or she's intentional or self-aware? Someone built it. Well, we're built by Allah, so then we wouldn't have free will either on that logic. Program that way. Obeys her programming. Okay, okay. Interesting. Anything else? A human built it. Okay, that's a decent. She's not a person. Does not. Well, I won't go to soul just yet because that requires another set of arguments. She doesn't have consciousness. Okay. Okay. That's another. No sense of right and wrong. Okay, but why? Can you? How can you confidently conclude that? You guys, would you agree with me when I say this? The reason we can safely conclude this because Siri is just machine and cold matter. It's just electrons and protons. Electricity and chemistry. There's no reason to believe an electron is self-aware. You know, electron is not going around thinking, why am I always buzzing and spinning? I deserve a break. You know, it's a, you know, a proton is not a conscious thing that freely chooses. I want to decay into a neutron today. Hashtag nerdy science jokes. So here we go. On naturalism, folks, everything is made up of this cold matter that's not self-aware. That's not intentional. But rather, everything is mechanical and mundane like Siri. So here we go then. Building upon this, human beings are also made up of the same cold matter. So on naturalism, human beings are just advanced electrochemical machines. We're just advanced biological robots. And robots don't freely choose. Machines don't freely choose. Our behavior and choices are mechanically determined by the chemicals and genes and stimuli of the environment. Just like Siri is responding to stimuli from us and whatever code that's built inside of us, she doesn't really choose choose. Human beings don't really choose choose. It's just an illusion. It's just chemicals and voltage change in your head. That is why naturalism denies true free will. You think if you think I'm strawmanning them, listen to what Sam Harris says. I'm gonna read this for us. 
This is a famous atheist, by the way, and a neuroscientist. Go ahead. In, in neuroscientific terms, no person is more or less responsible for the actions they perform. <laughs> you guys, we don't have to make an effort to make naturalism look bad. It's naturally bad, if I can put it that way. Um, now, understand this. If you don't freely choose, someone tell me, hashtag paraphrase, why does that remove moral responsibility? Hmm? Five. If you don't freely choose, do you really have moral responsibility? Okay, if, 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 you're, if you're not connecting the dots yet, let me help you with this one. I'm going to read this and put it into the chat box for me, you guys, the blank, if you could. Good on. When a Tesla when a Tesla veers off the road on autopilot, killing the passengers, it is considered a malfunction. Not a not a, not a what? Come on, not a not a murder or a, or a manslaughter. Yes, yes. Okay, well, another one. Here we go. When a lion kills a zebra, it kills the zebra. Not. One once again, what would it be? When a lion murder a zebra. not murder the zebra very good okay let, here's the third one when a hawk takes a fish from the pond it takes the fish not steals the fish very good tell me why folks tell me why tell me why why do we make that distinction so intuitively what do we understand about tesla and a lion and a fish or, or, or a hawk in this particular case what do we understand about them sister Aina? what do we understand so intuitively because like um like a tesla doesn't have an intention um but like if a driver like did it they did it with intention or negligence um, and a tesla doesn't freely choose does does it yeah yeah and animals we know doesn't have they don't have moral obligations they're not moral agents that freely intentionally choose they're just responding to their instincts and genetics but if that's what human beings are are we really responsible for our behavior if we don't really actually choose then do is can there be actual moral responsibility are you different than technically from tesla and the irony is we all know we choose. That's the most obvious thing to us that we freely choose. Which is why naturalism is so whack, because it undermines your immediate experience. To your immediate experience, the thing most accessible to you is an illusion. It's a deception. And when that worldview becomes your default, do you know the kind of behavior that leads to? Here, watch this. And then, honestly, I'm going to come to you, I promise. You guys, this is a famous case. Illinois, Illinois versus Leopold and Lett. This happened in 1924. Okay, I'm going to set this up for y'all. Amir, allow me to do this one. This is scary, y'all. Watch this. Leopold and Lett were two wealthy students at the University of Chicago. This is a famous case, by the way. Feel free to look it up. Who in the May, May of 1924 kidnapped and murdered a 14-year-old Bobby Franks in Chicago as an act of rebellion against conventional morality. They said morality is a construct. And you can see the kind of consequences that has. Now watch what happens. Their lawyer, Clarence Darrow, used the following defense. He said, science and evolution teaches us that man is an animal a little higher than the other orders of animals. That he is governed by the same mechanical laws that govern the rest of the universe. Is Dickie Leb to is Dickie Leb really to be blamed that his machine is imperfect? Who is to blame? It may be defective nerves. It may be a defective heart or liver. It may be defective in doctrine glands. Mm. Are you guys seeing this? It's just defective machinery. Do we really choose? How can we blame him for the murder? His wiring was wrong. He didn't intentionally choose as an Asian. Mm, I don't know if you guys are feeling what I'm feeling. Sister Zainab, talk to us if you can. I don't know if I can. <laughs> it feels like, like I all I can think is that if this is what the lawyer believes, I'm like, how are you in the justice system? <laughs> how are you like I, that the whole point of the justice system is based off of morality and right and wrong how why would you even go into that career in the first place it's like my like first question um but then it like it it makes the question of how how humanity has survived at all 
if we're all just machines and imperfect machines on top of that. Mm-hmm. 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 So Fatma, you had a question. Yeah, the whole time, like, I was wondering about, like, naturalism. Why do the naturalists, like, who propose these ideas, why would they want to bring down human beings to that level of animals? Like, I don't understand the reason why you want to bring yourself down, you know? Like, well, <laughs> well now, do you understand now why? Because, well, technically, you're, well, look, there's always a, there's always a flip side to the coin, right? So a naturalist, from their point of view, from their limited point of view, they're like, well, if there is no ultimate morality, that's freedom for me. You understand? So that's one possible advantage. The second is, if I'm not ultimately responsible, then, hey, anything goes. So hookup culture, sleeping around, you know, taking advantage, exploiting other countries, that happens, which you're about to see in the next, the point C. So it opens up certain venues of what they call freedom in a very limited sense of the word, but they, what they don't realize are the massive repercussions, the massive side effects that this leads to. When it's a white shooter, he's depressed. When there's a lot of depressed people who don't shoot up schools, oh my God, Sister Aina, thank you. Half a point for you. Uh, Anas, talk to us. I, I just, I'm, I'm completely mind blown at the fact that you said it yourself earlier. It literally says, smoking kills and we still have that choice to go grab the cigarette and smoke yes it. yes so it, just, it, it doesn't make sense how oh he uh biologically uh his body kind of like malfunctioned a little bit and he accidentally kidnapped this person and killed them whereas he had the choice brother mir he could have easily not done it <laughs> and you guys uh, uh and i'm gonna be very sens sensitive when i say this so this is where the conversation on mental health becomes a little tricky. And allow me to say that with all the sensitivity in the world. There are two extremes now. The naturalist extreme on mental health says that you being depressed is no different than you growing a sixth toe. It's completely outside of your control. You have nothing to do with it. You have nothing. It's like a genetic disorder. And it's there because you are not responsible for your actions is ultimately a product of genes and wiring and whatever. Then there's the other extreme, which is a religious zealot. They're like, you are depressed because you don't pray and you're away from God and X, Y, and Z. So there's the other extreme. As always, we're in the middle. Where we say, just like a cold, there may be an element of negligence that you weren't taking precautions, you didn't take the vaccine, and you didn't. You were hanging around with the wrong crowd, and you, you were able to get that cold. And now, once it's in, it's outside of your hand. Similarly, Depression may have a totally a mental health reality which is outside of your control. It does. But elements of spiritual neglect can lead to it. So there's that nuanced understanding we have when we approach mental health versus they have. Where they treat mental health diseases as totally out of your control as, well, murder in this case. Understand? We're not getting, I don't want to go down that tangent any further, but just the nuance. I wanted to introduce the nuance. Please keep this in mind. Okay, with this in mind, last one. And this leads me to the final, the most awful, the most dreadful reason why naturalism sucks when it comes to morality. Okay, here we go. This is where, uh, at least for me, chills go to an all-time high. Ready, Amir? Go ahead. On, uh, on naturalism, there is no ultimate moral, moral accountability because there is no higher power. So there is no ultimate reason to exercise moral restraint, no fear left in the moral decision making. Mm. Do you understand how dangerous this is? Folks, if you are someone in power, you're the head of the state, and you have an army behind you, and there is no hereafter, there is no higher power, then guess what? You are the highest power. You make the rules. You get to construct morality. You can justify literally anything because there's no ultimate standard, no ultimate authority to enforce a standard. It's just raw, selfish survival of the fittest in the dark jungle of life. And we as animals, like any other animals, we are in this jungle competing. If you understand this, if you understand this, then you have some idea of why 20th century was a bloodbath. You guys, Frederick Nietzsche saw it coming. 
He's an atheist philosopher, but he had the courage to look atheism straight in the eye and predict what this wicked worldview can lead to. I'm going to read this because I, uh, I feel way too passionate about this. Frederick Misha, by the way, famously declared the death of God. He wrote this in a book. He said, God in Europe is dead, meaning God no longer matters into the way we live our lives. He, he's not influencing our morality. He's not influencing the way we govern ourselves. God in Europe is dead because secularism had basically taken hold. Naturalism had taken hold by then. But he's an intelligent atheist. And he was able to see atheism squarely in the eye and says, where I relate to you is the history of the next two centuries. I describe what is coming, what can no longer can come differently, the advent of nihilism. What is nihilism? Nihilism is the destruction of all meaning, destruction of all purpose. Feel free to look it up yourself. He says, for some time now, our whole European culture has been moving towards a catastrophe with a tortured tension that is growing from decade to decade, restlessly, violently, headlong, like a river. Hmm. You know what catastrophe is talking about, folks? Hmm? He lived um, at the end of the 20th century. You know what violence he's talking about? World War I and II, number one. Two secular wars fought on nationalistic lines. What is he talking about? Rise of Nazism. Because Christianity has now been removed from the scene. There's no longer, there's no longer a divine ism on the scene. So other isms kick in. Like Nazism, a fanatical ideology stemming from Darwinism, the survival of the fittest. Communism, an atheist, anti-religious, fills the void. What happens? You guys, my heart bleeds as I share with you what I'm about to share with you right now. Under communism of Stalin, estimated 30 million people were killed through purges, famines, genocides, and forced labors. They weren't just atheists, they hated religion and everything sacred. Certainly they hated the notion that, sacred, that human life is sacred. They hated that notion, which is why it was so easy to spill blood. Under Mao Zedong, Sworn atheists. Estimated 50 to 100 million people were killed in what they call the Great Leap Forward Policy. That's not all. The killing fields of Cambodia, Pol Pot, Hitler. Human lives destroyed like ants in a colony. No worth, no value, no sacredness. No accountability, no higher power, no standard. When, when Allah and God and hereafter is out of the picture, I'm asking why exercise any moral restraint? There's no purpose or meaning or to anything. You lucked into 60 years of, of consciousness. Why not get to the top and enjoy your life by any means necessary? Who cares what suffering you cause to others? It's not like there's anything on the other side that's going to hold you accountable. It's not like it matters. You'll die one day and cease to exist. It won't matter ultimately. If you lived as a saint or Stalin. So, so, once again, we put Nancy on trial. And once again, folks, we ask her if that's her worldview, then on what grounds do you condemn the following that I'm about to show you? You guys, I'm about to put up scenarios that are morally outrageous, but it's difficult to condemn, condemn them on naturalism. If y'all can help, maybe figure out what would perhaps they say. How would an atheist stay face here? How would they make themselves look good here? And try, try to weasel out of this. Let's see what they can come up with and maybe we'll try to rebut. Heinrich Himmler, I'm going to read this. Uh, in, 19, in 1940s, a well-known atheist and a right-hand man of Hitler asked a very revealing question when confronted with Germany's difficult treaty obligations. <laughs> so, just so you guys know a little bit about this particular scenario, Heinrich Himmler is the right one of the one of the inner circle is a person in the inner circles of Hitler. And what started to happen toward the end of mid 1940s, Germany was starting to lose World War II, and now their treaty obligations and debts are becoming too much, too much to pay back. Heinrich Himmler, being an atheist, a naturalist. No ultimate right and wrong. He asked a very revealing question. He says, what compels us to keep our promises? And I would say on his worldview, he's right. What does compel you to keep your promises? <clears throat> Why do I have to uh, 
key promises. These are just key rules evolution or society wired into us. Why do I need to comply with that? Secondly, if I keep or break my promises, I don't actually choose anyways. I'm being compelled by my genes and nerves and stimuli. And third, why not be totally selfish and care about my Aryan race? Who cares if I break my promises to any other race? Survival of the fittest. What compels us? <coughs> These are the outrageous things you have to live with if you're a naturalist. That's really the point that I'm trying to make. This is what you call argument ad absurdum. This is what your worldview leads to. These insane absurdities that you intuitively know are wrong. <clears throat> Here's another scenario as we wrap up. Let me read it. The Human, <coughs> Human Betterment Foundation in the early 1900s, uh, uh, Champagne. Uh, uh, Amir, one second. Uh, sorry, Amir, one second. Amar had a question. Are, aren't there still consequences from other countries? Well, that depends. Maybe there's a country so powerful that they can impose consequences. But if they couldn't, Amar, what you're saying is that, not you, what they would be saying that since there are no consequences, hey, it is what it is. So, so it goes back to the fact that it's not objectively right and wrong. It's just like, can I someone hold a few to the fire? So go ahead now, Amr. The Human, uh, the Human Betterment Foundation in the early 1900s championed eugen eugenics by promoting mandatory uh, sterilization to purify the human gene pool from the genetically defective and physically unfit. This would only allow the fittest human beings to sexually, uh, to sexually act to be to be sexually active i'll be sexually active be sexually active and pass on their genes mm. uh you guys once again on what grounds are they wrong there's no ultimate standard human beings are no more special than any other animal and they're looking out by the way on this worldview that's why it's called human betterment foundation they're looking out for the long-term interests of the human beings and uh, uh, Amir asked a very important question. Are all atheist naturalists? Yes, by and large they are. Richard Dawkins actually t sells that. He's like, all atheists are by default naturalists. Sister Aina says, I think they would just say that we can still hold our own standards. Which is, and that's the definition of subjective morality. It's your standard, not binding on anyone else. And uh, yeah, and that's that's the door that opens to moral relativism. Here's the uh, uh, look at the absurdity of this. This, by the way, had enjoyed near scientific consensus, as we're going to see in a second. Hmm. No, I would say unless their fifth is against naturalism, but you have to brainwash yourself out of it. I, that's the way I would say. It. Listen to this. Here we go. This is someone who pushes naturalism to its inevitable conclusions, and has the honesty, and the candidness to actually say it without the fear of political incorrectness or political correctness. Go ahead, um, read this for us. Frederick Hellwald, a German ethologist. Ethologist. This is someone who studies ethics. Listen to what he says on naturalism. Just, just as in nature, the struggles for existence is the moving principle of evolution and perfection. So also in the world history, the destruction of the weaker nations through the stronger is a postulate of progress. <laughs> Folks. On this world, when British and French exploited South Africa, Middle East stole their resources, bankrupting them in the process, why is that wrong? We're maximizing our chances of survival. The weaker nations have to die off. It's just the cardinal rule in this jungle of life. And then finally, the last scenario. Again, I'm giving you firepower that you can throw at them because they have to be okay with this if they accept naturalism. Christopher J. Finlay has argued that communism legitimates violence because it rejects moral and ethical norms as constructs of the dominant class. Here we go again. Con morality is relative. It states that it would be conceivable for revolutionaries to commit atrocious crimes in bringing about a socialist system for the greater good. Mm -hmm. And that's how they did kill 30 million, 40 million people. Na'udhu billah min dhalik. So... That's why, by the way, Frederick, uh, John Locke, by the way, famous, famous Western philosopher, uh, he recognizes, by the way, he influenced the founding fathers heavily. Go ahead, I'm going to read this for us. Promises, uh, pro sorry, promise, promises, covenants, and oaths, which are, which are the bonds of human society, can have no hold upon an atheist. The taking away of God, even in thought, dissolves all. Mm -hmm. They see, they recognize, founding fathers, now they are, these are more deists, 
Uh, but they're still believers in God because they understand the absurdity that it leads to, or what atheism leads to. Now, with this in mind, you guys, just two, three devil's advocate, and then inshallah, we're done with the argument. I know it's 137. I need another maybe 10-ish minutes. Uh, there's a clip I really want you to see if you have the time. If you have to drop off, though, I totally, totally understand. But this is the punchline right here. Here we go. If Nancy the Naturalist says, Are you saying all naturalists and atheists are immoral people? Folks, is that what we're saying? That these atheists and, uh, and naturalists are all immoral people? Is that what we're saying, folks? What are we saying then, if not? It's what they're saying. But, they, but, but no, a, no naturalist would ever say they're immoral, like at least intentionally. Amar, what are we saying? Or what are they, what's, what, what are we, how are we characterizing them? We're saying they're not inherently immoral, but there is nothing stopping them besides like maybe the laws of the country they're in. But even then, if no one's watching, there is nothing in the way of them like doing that. whatever they want. I like that. Very good. Uh, half a half a point for you. Let me hear from Sister Aina. Sister Aina, you may be on mute. I think like they have morals, but um, like there's like implications like that as a society that they don't have to act on those morals. Um, mm. if, like the rest of the world goes against it. I see what you're saying. So uh, I'm going to kind of just tweak that wording. We're not saying that atheists can be good people. We know atheists, by the way, who do more humanitarian work that puts atheists to shame. We know that. What are we saying then? We are saying that on atheism, there is no definite standard of good and bad. <clears throat> no set definition of what is moral and immoral. You're standing on an ever-shifting moral landscape. Yeah. So you are good based on your narrow definition of good, which may be radically different tomorrow. Understand? So you just don't have an ultimate standard. So if you grew up in a society, here's what that means. If you grew up in a society where cannibalism was perfectly okay, like LGBTQ. By the way, I'm not comparing the two. Please forgive me. I'm just giving an example. If you grew up in a society where the, the, the zeitgeist of society was cannibalism is the way to go. This is what you do to your enemies. That would be your moral standard. And there is no objective, higher, transcendent standard that would ever correct you. It doesn't exist. Your morality is you, your POV. That's it. So we're not saying you're immoral. We're just saying whatever you call moral and immoral is flaky. And if you got your definition wrong because you were born in a wrong society, you're screwed. Because you don't have an ultimate standard that can correct you. Okay, here we go. So that leads me to the next one. They say... <clears throat> Go ahead, Amir, read this for us. But we can have objective morality without God. Why you gotta bring God into everything? Here, here is the objective moral standard. So Sam Harris wrote a famous book called The Moral Landscape, and he tries to create a moral standard that doesn't appeal to a higher power. He's like, here is how you get an objective standard. He says, Go ahead, write this down, folks, in your guidebook as well. You want me to read it? Yes. Whatever promotes human flourishing or redu reduces human suffering is good and moral. When whatever doesn't is immoral. He's like, there you go. There's an objective standard, you know, and we can easily use this standard to determine pretty much every calculated in every scenario what is objectively right and what is objectively wrong. You just have to look at the fact: does it create human flourishing, or does it reduce human or does it reduce human suffering? If it does, we're gonna put the moral label of good. The value of that will be good, and if it goes the other way we're gonna call it bad folks how do we respond to this for the sake of time allow me to just jump right into this first thing we say the moment human beings decide the standard it is no longer independent of human opinion because now it's tied to that group's agreement we just want you to be honest you're saying it's objective but realize that depends on that group whoever this council that decided the standard it depends on that group's consensus. People in Papua New Guinea, some desert nomads, it's not binding on them. They weren't privy to this. Understand though, it seems, in, it seems objective, but it's definitely not independent. So you can play with words all you want. Biases have to kick in. It's your group's agreement. Please at least be honest enough to recognize that. Number two, even if we accept the standard, hypothetically everybody accepted the standard, who can thoroughly calculate the long and short-term benefits and harms of a moral stance on humans? You guys think about that. 
This is the big flaw of the utilitarian theory. Like right now, you're studying, or let's say you are, uh, you are someone who is using the vaccine. And right now, you think vaccine is good because of the flourishing it's bringing about. It's helping us defeat corona. But what if four generations from now, this leads to some terminal disease? In that situation, that vaccine would be immoral. But we don't have access to that data because human beings live short lives. We'll never know the ultimate. It's hard to tell the ultimate cost and benefits of a particular decision. That's why Allah has to step in in the Quran. When they're like, they ask you about alcohol, Allah says, feet. It does have some benefit, but the harm far outweighs the benefit. In Allah's divine calculation, good does good does not outweigh the evil. In someone who's drinking and is born in a society, obviously they're gonna be biased. How are they gonna be neutral about the benefits and the costs? Your bias will kick in, your self-interest will kick in, your profit motives will kick in. And then finally, the last one. Even if you accept the standard somehow. And could somehow magically calculate the ultimate benefits and harms. Why would it be binding on any other group? <laughs> See, a group of Vikings refuse to accept. On what ground can they be obliged? It's just your human opinion that you're calling objective versus theirs. Why would it be binding on anyone? It's just human beings against human beings. Imagine aliens conquer us from a different planet and they want to use human beings as fuel and food. <laughs> what are you gonna tell them? Huh? It's objectively wrong. They're like, why are we obliged to follow your standard? You know, you're just nothing more than a spin-off of evolutionary process. Huh? What do, what's so sacred of a secret about you? You eat other animals, we eat you. What's so sacred about you? Huh? Why do why why do we have to respect your standard? There's nothing morally binding and objective about it. Anas, talk to us. Um can you just go back to that slide really quick? Yes. So whatever promotes human flourishing or reduces human suffering is good and moral. Yes. Just, I, think, I think the reflection I'm making here is just like you mentioned about the vaccine. You could either say like, um, let's say like Hitler uh, came out and had a khutbah saying that if I make the Aryan race, we will have this, this and that. And they're like, oh, well, that sounds morally good. That's mm -hmm. That sounds like it's going to reduce human suffering. So it's moral. Do it. That's profound. So you, so you don't notice, Anas, you're going back to the second point. Who gets to calculate the ultimate good and benefit, right? Should Hitler get to calculate? Because according to him, in the long term, long term benefits will justify the, the concentration camps now. Your calculation may be subjective, as subjective as anybody else. Very good point, Anas. Thank you so much. I don't know if you guys caught on to that. That's a logic Hitler can follow too. And that's what eugenics movement did, which is what I'm about to play for you right now. I know some of you may be difficult. It's just a two, three minute clip that I wanted to show you. You guys, this really drives the point home. Here we go. Uh, 2738, let's go to that real quick. In September of 1921, leading scientists from around the globe gathered at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City for the Second International Congress of Eugenics. Eugenics was the science of breeding better people. The term had been coined by Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. But Darwin himself helped lay the groundwork for eugenics in his book, The Descent of Man. According to Darwin, Human beings develop through a long and cruel process of natural selection or survival of the fittest. Less fit organisms died, leaving more capable organisms to reproduce and flourish. It was this ruthless process of elimination, not the foresight of a designer, that had propelled human beings to the top of the evolutionary ladder. But Darwin worried that modern society was now doing its best to undermine natural selection. We civilized men do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed and the sick. We institute poor laws. And our medical men exert their utmost skill to save the life of everyone to the last moment. There is reason to believe that vaccination has preserved thousands who from a weak constitution would formerly have succumbed to smallpox. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals would doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. 
Hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. You understand what just was said? They're like, people didn't have immunity to smallpox and we allowed them to live. Their weak immune systems were passed on. You don't breed your weakest animals. Why are you letting weak human beings survive? Let the process of natural selection continue. Let the weak die off. Aren't kind of logic. Plan, Darwin was troubled by the implications of his theory for society. But his followers had a solution. They thought they could apply Darwinian selection rationally and humanely through the science of eugenics, which became known as the self-direction of human evolution. Eugenics was eagerly embraced by America's scientific elites. Sometimes today it's argued that eugenics was just fringe science, just a few people believed in it. And of course we don't believe in it now. That ignores the fact that for decades, eugenics was what could be called the consensus view of the scientific community. Yes. The Eugenics Congress at the American Museum of Natural History drew scientists from America's top research institutions, including Harvard, Yale, MIT, the Smithsonian, Ohio State, UC Berkeley, and the University of Texas. Participants included inventor Alexander Graham Bell, and Charles Darwin's own son, Leonard, who lashed out at the threat biological defectives pose to modern society. Scientists were welcomed to the Eugenics Congress by then president of the American Museum of Natural History, Henry Fairfield Osborne. Now, last thing I wanted to show you guys is this right here. It is 3913. This is what you don't get to hear in school. <clears throat> Over others. Across America, Catholic clergy actively resisted the eugenics crusade. In Louisiana, the Catholic Church played a key role in preventing the passage of a sterilization law. This is really Catholic sad. opposition to eugenics was so pronounced. Sorry, this is really, really sad what you're about to hear. Uh... That some eugenics groups targeted the Catholic Church for attacks. The Human Betterment Foundation in California was dedicated to promoting eugenics through forced sterilization. Its president, E.S. Gosney, lashed out at Catholic efforts to block sterilization laws. Every legislature considering a sterile... I want you to look at his logic, and I'm asking once again, Nancy, why is this unnaturalism wrong? The bill in the United States is visited by representatives of the bishop or archbishop who lay down the law of Rome to those willing to accept it. The henchmen are prompt to fall in line. Gosney suggested that the Catholic Church should be asked to pay for Catholics who aren't sterilized. If Catholics do not want their feeble-minded communicants sterilized, it would seem more logical to ask them, as Hitler has done in Germany, to keep these feeble-minded segregated at their own expense, in order that the American Commonwealth may be subjected to no unnecessary damage from the presence of a great body of defectives who increase the amount of human misery, contribute largely to the ranks of the delinquent and criminal, augment the tax burdens, diminish the efficiency of industry, and dilute the quality of American citizenship. Wow. The eugenics movement and the supporters of eugenics in the, the early 20th century actually tried to make an anti-Catholic campaign part of their public argument. On the one hand, they claimed that their ideas were based firmly in natural science, and yet they actually ran a public campaign that was anti-religious. You get the impression that there was something more than simple empirical science at stake in the debate. Despite opposition from Catholics and others, the American eugenics movement continued to flourish in the years leading up to World War II. The eugenics movement eventually led to the forced sterilization of more than 60,000 people in America. Please listen to this. Compulsory person. sterilization in the name of eugenics was eugenics movement continued to flourish in the years leading up to World War II. Listen to this. The eugenics movement eventually led to the forced sterilization of more than 60,000 60. people in America. Compulsory sterilization in the name of eugenics was ultimately upheld by the United States Supreme Court in a decision that declared three generations of imbeciles are enough. Oh, uh, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Oh, Wallahi, this deserves a moment of silence. Many of those sterilized would not be considered mentally handicapped today.
The eugenics movement also succeeded in securing the passage of a draconian immigration law that sharply restricted the flow of non-Nordic ethnic groups into the United States. While considering the legislation, the United States Congress invited testimony by a leading eugenist on the biological aspects of immigration. Starting in the 1920s in particular, there was a huge push for immigration restrictions on people who were coming from non Germanic, non-Northern uh, European countries, and so uh, people coming from Mexico to the United States or people coming from Africa or Southern European countries that had people that the eugenists viewed as evolutionarily backwards, they had to be stopped because they were going to destroy our society. But the and this is a logic you see, by the way, in the white supremacists of today. Nasallallahu al-'Afiy, folks. Nasallallahu al-'Afiy. So, folks, in summary, then, if Islamic theism is true, we have a sound, sound foundation. Alhamdulillah for, for objective morality that accounts for our moral instinct, our moral values, our moral obligations, and moral accountability. And if on naturalism, however, human beings are like any other animal, our morality is a chance outcome of evolution for its survival value. Yeah, hence there's nothing objectively right or binding about it. In addition, there can be no moral responsibility because there's no free will nor ultimate accountability to a higher power. So, with this in mind, inshallah, we'll stop right here. Um, I wanted to cover one more principle, but inshallah, we'll do that next time. Uh, you guys, thank you for uh, sticking around for so long. Um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this was a means of benefit to you and uh, you felt what I felt preparing for this argument and uh, I hope inshallah we become the means of guidance when you see stuff like this you appreciate the dua in the Quran Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada thank Allah for guiding us to this وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ where would we be if this was the world and these are the absurdities that it leads to نَسَلُ اللَّهِ الْعَافِيَةِ by the way what is eugenics yesterday is you know what they call the radical left today. I mean, incest right now is becoming okay. Bestiality is becoming okay. You notice the repercussions once their moral standard is out of the way, there is no consistent moral standard. Right and wrong become the flavor of the month. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be consistent and dedicated to guidance. That's it, folks. That's what I wanted to share today. Any questions? Going once. Yeah, I just uh, I posted it on the on the chat already, but I mentioned like two movies that I saw that this kind of reflected me on. One is called The Thinning, and the other one is called uh, What Happened to Monday. And both of them have very similar like um, it's morally right to kill this group of people because either they don't fit in society or because wow. the population is growing so much. Wow! 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 Thank and you. these are just like really good, good movies that uh, will show exactly what you talked about today. SubhanAllah. Thank you so much for that. That's actually fascinating. I was not aware of this, but you're absolutely right. It fits very well into this narrative. Okay. So with this in mind, inshallah, you guys will stop right here. So, uh, reach out to me with any questions. SubhanAllah. Bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfirullah wa natubu ilayk. Wa la'asr inal insana lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa amanu al-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haqi wa tawasaw bil-sif. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Jazakallah khair.